Hi guys, my name is Dr. Wallace. Welcome to Clinical Anatomy. This first lecture really just does a big overview of anatomy, um, specifically clinical anatomy. We'll go through a lot of the things that you should have learned in your undergraduate anatomy and physiology one and two courses, just to make sure we're all on the same page and that we're getting started um, on the right foot. So first, we need to understand what is clinical anatomy? Systemic anatomy is the anatomy that you probably studied in undergrad. This is the anatomy where we're looking at the study of organ systems. So you probably studied the cardiovascular system together. Right? You look at the heart, you look at the blood vessels, you look at the blood, um, the skeletal system, the respiratory system, lymphatic. Um, at least in my undergrad AMP, that's how we organize it. We organize it by body system. Um, and when you're studying systemic anatomy, you're really looking at the individual anatomy or the individual physiology or function of that system and that system alone. Regional anatomy, on the other hand, is an anatomical study that's organized by body area or body region. So in this case, we're not looking at just one body system, right? We're looking at the cooperative functions of all of the body systems in the area and the ways that they come together, the ways that they relate to each other anatomically. Um, for example, in this class, we all studied the thorax, right? Everything in the thorax at the same time. We've got the integumentary system, um, you have the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. We have the muscular system, right? All of the muscles that are present in the thorax. We have the skeletal system, right? The 12 pairs of ribs. Um, we've got the, the sternum. We have underneath that cardiovascular, right? We've got blood vessels, we've got the heart, blood. We have respiratory, the lungs are present in the thorax. We have quite a few different systems all coming together in this one body region. Um, and this is a bit more realistic because in actuality, none of the systems exist on their own. None of the systems exist separately from each other. So looking at them as they relate to each other uh, gives us a little bit more of a realistic perspective or realistic point of view. Part of regional anatomy is what we call surface anatomy. Surface anatomy looks at the parts that are actually visible from the outside, right? The parts that you can see or the parts that are palpable, right? The parts that you can feel and touch from the outside of the body. This is gonna be a very important part of your physical exam. And when you do a physical exam, you're going to observe the patient, you're gonna look at them, you're going to touch them, right? And palpate for um, lymph nodes or palpate for um, swelling or for tension or for pain. Um, and you can't complete an adequate physical exam if you don't have good knowledge of surface anatomy. So an example um, is over here on the right. In this example, you see a practitioner palpating what we call the snuff box. So this little depression right here is the snuff box. Um, and the way that you can find that is extend the thumb. And when you extend your thumb, you'll see, I don't know if you guys can see it on me, this little triangle depression right there. And if you push in that depression, what you're palpating is um, the scaphoid bone, right? one of your carpal bones. When a patient falls and they extend their arms and they catch themselves, um, they typically are going to, if they fracture something, they're gonna fracture either the radius or the scaphoid. The scaphoid represents um, one of the most common wrist fractures that you'll see. So if a patient describes a fall like that, right, and they have pain, limited movement in their wrist, you can palpate the snuff box, right? And you know that what you're actually palpating is the scaphoid bone because you have a good knowledge of surface anatomy. Um, up top here, you can just actually, you can see, right, the, um, the tendons that form the borders of the snuff box. And then you could see how just right inside that snuff box, you have the scaphoid bone. So we talked about anatomy based on body systems. We talked about um, anatomy based on body regions. The real specific focus of this course is clinical anatomy. And clinical 
anatomy emphasizes the aspects of anatomy that are important to the practice of medicine. This utilizes both of the other types of anatomy. Right? It utilizes systemic anatomy, how different parts of the body system are working together, and then it also utilizes regional anatomy, what's happening in that specific region that you're looking at. The importance here, though, with clinical anatomy is that it stresses clinical application. Um, if you look at the picture that's shown over here, hey, speaking of anatomy, right, what bone is this? You should know that this is the axis, right? This is the C2 vertebra. What's this part sticking up? That's the dens, right? Remember that sticks up and that articulates with C1, which is atlas. So this is showing some um, common fractures of C2. And looking at this for, with clinical anatomy or applying a clinical focus, we could categorize these fractures as, um, <clears throat> sorry, a type one fracture, right? Just the tip of the dens, a type two fracture at the base of the dens, or a type three fracture that extends all the way down into the body of the vertebra. We could then talk about the clinical importance of this. Hey, how are you going to treat a type one versus type two or type three? What's the likely outcome with type one, type two, and type three fractures of the axis? Hey, that's taking the just plain anatomy and converting it to clinical anatomy. Um, the same thing with the last picture, right? On the last picture, you could say that the scaphoid bone is on the distal radial side of the carpal bones. Um, but when you take that a step further and say that that's a common wrist fracture, um, or you could say that in order to diagnose that wrist fracture, you're going to palpate um, in the region, right, right here, the snuff box, and see if there's pain upon palpation. You're taking the anatomy and using it in a clinical setting. That's what we're really going to focus on doing um, or learning to do throughout this entire semester. In order to do that, we need to review a lot of information that you guys learned in Anatomy and Physiology 1. As we go through really this whole PowerPoint, this should be a quick review for you guys. If it's not, go back and look at some of this. Review your notes or your book from Anatomy and Physiology 1 and 2 and make sure that you're really comfortable with all of this. So when we use anatomical um, terminology, right, technical terminology, we're assuming that the patient is in what's called the anatomical position, right? Regardless of what position they're actually in, when we use directional terms, for example, we're assuming that the patient is in anatomical position. The anatomical position is like this, right? The person is erect, facing forward. The face is forward, right? The uh, arms are straight with the palms forward. The legs are straight, the feet are close together with the toes pointing forward. An important thing to remember when you're um, using directional terms or describing um, a wound or um, pain in a, in a patient, remember that the left and right you're talking about are the patient's left and right, not your left and right. right? So in most cases, you're gonna have to, to flip flop right, and go opposite. Um, the worst thing in the world you can do is, is perform surgery on the wrong leg, right, or the wrong arm, because something as simple as left and right. So when you're looking at this, using anatomical terminology makes it really easy to describe the point of interest on the patient using anatomical terms. So look over here, you see the star? Say that was a wound. Okay, that was a stab wound. How would you describe the location of this wound using anatomical terminology? Well, first off, I'm going to decide is that left or right, right? That is the patient's right. You know, turn yourself around. This side is the right. Um, <clears throat> so it's on the right side of the body. It's just below the nipple, but am I going to say below? Well, I'm going to use our anatomical terminology, inferior, right? So it is about one inch inferior 
to the right nipple. Going a little bit further with terminology, planes, remember, are imaginary flat surfaces that pass through the body. And these are important when we talk about imaging studies, right? When we talk about MRIs or CT scans, we get them according to specific planes, and that'll show us different organs, right? Or different um, views of the body. A frontal plane or coronal plane passes through the body vertically, right? Up and down, dividing the body into front and back. A sagittal plane also passes through the body vertically, but a sagittal, sagittal plane is going to divide the body into left and right. Okay, so it's going to pass through the body and divide the body into left and right. Now, a sagittal plane can be mid-sagittal. We also call that commonly median because it is directly in the middle of the body along the, the median plane. Right, so if this was passing through my body vertically and literally going through the very, very tip of my nose, dividing my body into equal left and right parts, that would be a median or mid-sagittal plane. If it's passing through the body parallel to that median plane, but anywhere else besides the exact middle, that would be parasagittal right, or paramedian. Still dividing the body into left and right parts, but they're not equal anymore. Right, so I could pass through the body right here, right here, right over here, right? Those are all paramedian or parasagittal. A transverse plane passes through the body horizontally, right? So coming through horizontally, dividing the body into top and bottom, or superior and inferior regions. Okay, so here we can see the planes that we spoke about and we can kind of see how we can visualize the organs inside the body according to those different planes. Um, over here you can see the frontal plane again divides the body into front and back. So on the far right here you can see the frontal plane, plane cutting through the body and we can visualize um, or we're, we're looking into the back of the body but we can visualize um, a section according to that frontal plane or coronal plane. Remember that the sagittal plane also goes vertically, but it divides the body into right and left. So right here, we can see this section has been taken um, along a sagittal plane. It looks like it's mid-sagittal or median. Um, it appears as if it's gone through the body perfectly at that midpoint. If it had gone through um, a little further to one side or the other so that the body was, was cut in um, unequal left and right halves, then again, that would be paramedian or parasagittal. This right here um, is a section that's taken along the transverse plane. Again, the transverse plane is going to come through the body horizontally, um, dividing it into top and bottom or superior and inferior regions. Here we can see different terms of relationship or directional terms. Again, these should all be familiar to you. If not, go back and review them. Directional terms come in um, typically in opposite pairs, right? Just like we would say up and down, front and back, left and right. Um, these directional terms also come in pairs. So cranial and caudal, cranial meaning towards the cranium, right? Towards the skull caudal meaning towards the tail, towards the coccyx. We could also say superior towards the top and inferior down towards the bottom. So the knee is inferior to the hip, right? Or the knee is superior to the foot. As far as front and back, we could do anterior and posterior, right? Anterior is towards the front, posterior is towards the back. Or we could do ventral and dorsal. Ventral meaning towards the belly side, dorsal meaning towards the back, right? Think about a dorsal fin. The dorsal fin on a dolphin or on a shark is on the back. Dorsal means back. Medial and lateral. Medial um, is referring to the midline of the body, right? So towards the center of the body is medial. 
Lateral means pertaining to the side. So towards the side of the body is lateral. If you play sports, think of a lateral pass, right? A lateral pass is towards the side of the field. So the hip is more lateral than the belly button. The belly button is more medial. Proximal and distal um, refer to the extremities, right? So the arms or the legs. Proximal means towards the site of attachment. Distal is more distant from the site of attachment. So say I had a wound right here. Okay, the root wound right here is proximal to my elbow. Okay, or I could say it is distal from my shoulder. And those apply to the arms and the legs. Over on the left, you see a couple other terms. Bilateral means that something is paired um, with one on each side of the body. So think about in the body, we have quite a few things that are bilateral, right? The eyes are bilateral, the ears are bilateral, um, the lungs, the kidneys, right? We've got lots of pairs um, on either side of the body. Unilateral means that it's occurring only on one side of the body, right? Uni meaning one, lateral meaning side. Um, so let's see what's unilateral, the gallbladder. Right, the kidney, I mean, sorry, not the kidney, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas. These are all unilateral. Ipsilateral and contralateral are opposites. Um, ipsilateral means that two things are on the same side of the body, right? So your right eye and right ear, your left eye and left ear are ipsilateral. Um, contralateral is on opposite sides. So your eyes are located contralaterally. They're on opposite sides of the body. A couple other terms of relationship or um, directional terms. We could say external or internal. Right? Internal is the inside. So here you see uh, the inside of the stomach. You can see all the rugae or folds in the, mu the mucosa of the stomach. External is the outside. Deep and superficial. Superficial is towards the surface, right? So here you see the skin is superficial. And then once you pull that off, you can see everything that's down deep. So in this case, the arrows point to the muscles, which are deeper than the skin. There are also many anatomical terms that are related to movement. And again, these should all be familiar. Um, we see abduction and adduction, again, opposite movements. Abduction is moving a limb further from the midline of the body, right? So like my arm, I could abduct it, right? I'm moving it away from the midline. Adduction with just Ds is moving it closer to the midline, right? Like you're adding it to your body. Um, you could do with your legs as well, right? So if you look right here, you see abduction moving the leg away from the midline. Adduction is moving the leg towards the midline, right? So this movement's occurring at her hip. She's abducting her hip and then adducting her hip. Um, rotation is just literally rotating. One bone twists or rotates on the other. So we have lateral and medial rotation of the shoulder. We can also have lateral and medial rotation of the lower arm, right? Remember how the head of the radius rotates on the capitulum of the humerus, right? So you can have lateral and medial rotation of the um, forearm and hand. Here you see lateral and medial rotation of the leg. This is occurring at the hip, right? If you twist or rotate the leg towards the outside, that's lateral rotation. Twisting it back in towards the inside is medial rotation. Flexion and extension occur at multiple different joints. Um, the, the elbow is an easy way to look at this, but flexion of the elbow, extension of the elbow. Um, flexion is just decreasing the angle between two bones. So the angle between my humerus and my ulna right now is 180 degrees. When I do this, now it's 90 degrees. I decreased that angle. Extension is increasing the angle, right? So when I extend it out, 
I've increased that angle from 90 to 180 degrees. Um, the flexion and extension, you can see happening here at the shoulder joint, right? She's flexing and then back is extending that shoulder joint. Um, flexion and extension, we already looked at the elbow here. You can do uh, the hand, right? So flexion of the hand, extension of the hand, right? Flexion of the hand, extension of the hand, flexion, extension. Here you can see at the knee, right? Flexion of the knee. We're decreasing this angle to 90 degrees. Extension is straightening it back out so that this angle is 180 degrees. Circumduction. Circumduction is when the entire limb is going in a circle. Um, you can do it here. This is circumduction, the actual movement occurring at the hip. You could also do it with your um, shoulder, your shoulder circumducts, right? If I move the end of the limb in a circle, sometimes people confuse circumduction with rotation because there's, there's this kind of circling around with both of them. But imagine if I had a crayon, right, or a marker in my hand. If I'm rotating, there's just one point on the piece of paper. Right, my hand is not actually moving anywhere, it's just rotating. With circumduction, I would draw a circle. Right, the hand is actually moving in a circle with circumduction. Okay, again down here, it's happening, um, the foot is moving in a circle when the hip circumducts. Down here, both of these are related to the foot, inversion and eversion. Inversion is turning the sole of the foot inward. Okay, so go ahead, do it with yours right now. Flip the sole of your foot inward. Ever, um, <clears throat> eversion is the opposite. They okay, try and twist the sole of your foot outward. It's really hard to evert. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, again with the foot. What does dorsal mean? The back, right? Dorsal fin is on the back. So the dorsal side of the foot is this back side of the foot. Dorsiflexion is flexing the dorsal part of the foot up. Okay, so point your toes up. That's dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion is down towards the plantar part of the foot, right at the bottom of the foot. So point your toes down. That's plantar flexion. Um, protraction and retraction. Here you see the jaw protracting and retracting. So if you push your jaw out, that's protraction. Now if you pull it in, that's retraction. Finally, supination and pronation. Um, your hand, when you have the palm forward, okay, the palm is forward, that's supination. When you twist the palm backwards, that's pronation. Okay, supination, pronation. Think of it like laying down. When you're laying down supine, the belly is up. Right, the belly of the hand is up. Prone is when you're laying belly down, right? So the belly of the hand goes down, goes back. So supination, pronation. Okay, so we've gone through all of this anatomical terminology, right? Now we're going to go through some of the body systems, or really most of the body systems, really rapidly, and make sure that you guys are comfortable with all of the anatomy. Um, and some of the physiology and clinical importance of these body systems. We'll go through most of it on this video. Um, we might have to save some of um, neuro for in class, but we'll see how far we get. So let's start with integumentary system. The integument is the skin, right? So the integumentary system obviously includes the skin. Um, it also includes the structures that stem from the skin. So the hair, the nails, some exocrine glands, right? Like sweat glands, um, sebaceous glands or oil glands, ceruminous glands, right? That produce cerumen or earwax. These exocrine glands um, that are associated with the integumentary system are included in this study. The functions of the integumentary system, protection, 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 and more protection, right? The integumentary system forms this barrier that separates what's inside of the body from what is outside of the body. 
when we look at the integumentary system, it's a really great barrier that keeps pathogens out, right? That keeps chemicals out. Um, it doesn't scratch or tear very easily. And the reasons for that are that, one, there's a really high degree of cellularity. Right? That means there's a lot of cells patched really closely together. A lot of those cells are hooked together by desmosomes. So they're really tightly locked. Also, remember that as this, the, um, the skin, right, or the skin cells go towards the surface of the epidermis, they get keratinized, packed with keratin. And keratin is a really strong protein. It resists abrasion, and it's also water resistant. Okay, so this is, again, something that helps the skin be a really good barrier. The skin also provides UV protection because of melanin. We have melanocytes scattered throughout the um, the bottom of the epidermis, and those melanocytes make melanin. Melanin, that the dark pigment, um, provides UV protection. Containment of tissues and waters. Again, the skin is a great barrier. It keeps everything inside, inside. Um, without the our skin, specifically the keratin that's in our skin, we would see Right, the water would seep out of us. It would evaporate out of us very, very quickly, right? Like a slug. A slug just dehydrates very fast. We don't do that. We can contain our water uh, because of the keratin that's present in our integumentary system. The skin's important for temperature regulation. Uh, we just said that the skin includes sweat glands, and we produce sweat to cool the body off. Um, the fat deposits that are present, mostly in the subcutaneous layer, help to provide insulation um, to help keep the body warm and regulated. And then also the blood flow that's present in the integumentary system can be altered um, to help regulate body temperature. When you're hot, remember you get, you get red, right? Um, it shows more in lighter skinned individuals, but the blood all comes to the surface to let that heat radiate out into the environment. When you're cold, the skin pales because the blood is kept in the core so that the heat doesn't radiate off, but also so that the key organs are kept warm. Okay, so temperature regulation um, is an important function of the integumentary system. Sensation, we've got all sorts of um, nerves and nerve endings that are present in the integumentary system that allow us to have the sensation of touch, right? texture, pressure, vibration, pain, temperature all of these sensations. Finally, vitamin D production and storage. Um, in the presence of UV radiation, your epidermal cells make vitamin D. Um, and vitamin D is a lipid soluble vitamin, so we store it in the lipidy tissue in the subcutaneous layer. All right, here you see the skin. Um, or the integumentary system. There is a lot here in this slide. You should know all of it, okay? Um, up at the top here, the most superficial layer of the skin is the epidermis. Epi means upon, right? So this is upon the dermis, the layer on top of the dermis. Down below that is the dermis. Okay? And then underneath the dermis, we've got subcutaneous tissue. Um, this is also called the superficial fascia. We have the superficial fascia, which is um, a loose connected tissue. And then underneath that, we'll have the deep fascia, which is a dense, regular connective tissue, really, really dense and strong, packed with collagen. The epidermis, remember, is epithelial tissue. So it is avascular, right? Meaning no blood vessels. The dermis, however, does have blood flow. Okay, so the dermis is vascular. Um, cutting down or damaging down to the dermis will produce bleeding. Um, underneath the dermis, the subcutaneous layer, again, vascular. Um, and this is where we have a lot of adipose tissue. Right? So all this yellow that you see is showing us fat that's down in the subcutaneous layer, the superficial fascia. Again, underneath that, the deep fascia is present. Again, with lots of collagen for strength. Looking at this, you should be comfortable with um, the erector peline muscle. You should be comfortable with the parts of the hair, the sweat gland, um, sebaceous glands, uh, or oil-producing gl glands. You should be comfortable with vessels and lymphatics um, and all the little details in the picture. The deep fascia isn't always covered in undergraduate anatomy and physiology, so I want to make sure that we mention this a little bit. 
the deep fascia, again, is dense, regular connective tissue um, that's just deep to the subcutaneous layer, or just underneath the subcutaneous layer. Remember, deep, regular connective tissue has a lot of collagen in the extracellular matrix. It is packed with collagen. And regular means that that collagen um, is oriented in very specific directions. Okay, so this really provides strength. The deep fascia um, extends to form lots of different structures that you're probably familiar with. Um, investing fascia, this goes in and um, invests into individual muscles or neurovascular bundles. Intermuscular septa, intermuscular septa will go in and divide muscles into compartments or into groups. So looking at the picture over here, you can see these septa, right? These intermuscular septa going in, this is the arm, the brachial region or the upper arm. And all these little lines are showing you the septa that divide the muscles up. So this is the humerus in the middle. And then the biceps muscle, right, right here. Remember right underneath the biceps is the brachialis. And then one, two, three, those are the three heads of the, the triceps muscles. Right, so you can see that those are divided up um, by extensions of the deep fascia. Um, the deep fascia also forms what we call subserous fascia. Um, these are between muscular walls and serous membranes. Um, also, retinacula. So you've probably seen retinacula, you can see right here. Right when you look at the muscles. Um, so what the retinacula does is, it's, again, collagen, it's really strong, um, mostly collagen, collagenous layer. Um, and the retinacula holds tendons in place. So when the muscle pulls on the tendon, um, the tendon kind of stays where it's supposed to and just slides along the retinacula instead of, say, popping up, right, or pulling in, in a direction that it shouldn't be going. It's stabilized. Uh, I'll show you how that actually works in one second. And then also bursa. This deep fascia extension forms the bursa. Remember bursa are these little fluid-filled sacs. This is showing you the knee joint where there's a lot of bursa present. But these fluid-filled sacs are in synovial joints, and they're really kind of just like cushions. Um, they can cushion between bones, they can cushion between a tendon and a bone, or muscles and bone, um, and they provide a lot of, again, cushioning and kind of shock impact um, in the synovial joints. Here you see uh, the flexor retinacula. This is, um, so in the distal portion, right, the distal, portion of the arm um, and the flexors, remember the flexors, right, are on this side of the arm, the anterior side of the arm. Let me see if this will play for us. Oh, it's not going to play for us. Okay, so when you pull up the PowerPoint at home, play this. It's so cool. Um, you'll see the guy will pull on the tent, he'll pull on the tendon um, and you'll see that the fingers will flex as he pulls on the tendons, uh, but you'll also see the beautiful stabilization, stabilization right there he, from the retinacula. Again, an extension of the deep fascia. Oh, there it's playing. Okay, watch. So right here, this is what we're talking about. Really cool. So we'll talk about a couple um, clinical situations that are related to the integumentary system. First, remember we said that um, there's a lot of collagen fibers present in the skin. The orientation, right, or the direction that those collagen fibers are going will create what we call tension lines in the skin. Um, you probably call them wrinkles, right? These tension lines appear as folds in the skin um, during skin movement. So if you smile, right, you'll see tension lines, you'll see them around your eyes, um, you'll see them on your forehead. Mine doesn't move very much right now, thank goodness. Uh, but go ahead and raise your eyebrows and you should see uh, that tension lines appear on the forehead. Again, these occur because of the orientation of the collagen fibers. This matters to you uh, when you're doing surgery, making some sort of an incision. 
If possible, we want to do incisions parallel to the tension lines, um, and this will result in better healing and less scarring. So if you think about it, say my tension lines, right, my collagen fibers are going like this in both situations. Okay, then say I come in and I'm going to make an incision. Um, this one, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to, and I'm going to make the incision parallel to my collagen fibers. I might disrupt a little bit of collagen, but not very much, right? So imagine over here, I do what I'm not supposed to, and I cut like that. I'm going to disrupt much more collagen that way, right? And the wound is going to gape or pull apart, um, and it's going to have a lot harder time healing. So there's going to be a lot more scarring in that in the second situation. So again, if possible, we want to cut um, or make incisions parallel to those tension lines. And they're really easy to see. Just move the skin and you'll see where it naturally folds. Burns are um, also important when we're talking about the integumentary system. Burns can come from lots of different sources. We're all familiar with thermal burns, right? Temperature, you touch the hot stove and you get burnt. Um, but burns can also come from electrical sources, right? There's electrical burns, radioactive burns, and then chemical burns as well. Um, regardless, though, we are damaging the integrity of the um, integumentary system. So this is important, right? Infection is a huge risk because now there's pathogen entry. Dehydration is actually a risk because the water can simply seep out now. When we look at burns, we classify burns as first degree burns, second degree burns, and third degree burns. And that's just based on severity and really the depth of the burn. So first degree burns, the damage is just limited to the superficial epidermis. Okay, you haven't gotten down to the vascular tissue below. These heal relatively well. Secondary burns are a little bit worse. The damage does go through the epidermis down to the dermis, but the damage is limited to the superficial parts of the dermis. Because of that, um, tissues like the hair follicle, um, some of the dividing cells and sweat glands, these, these living, functioning, dividing cells are still okay. They're undamaged. So those cells can actually serve as replacement cells for the cells in the basal layer of the epidermis. So the epidermis can regenerate. Okay? It's able to reform and the skin can heal without, um, without any skin grafts. However, in a third degree burn, the entire epidermis is damaged and the entire dermis is damaged. So there are no basal cells available to go replace the cells in the epidermis so the skin cannot regenerate. Um, in this case, that requires skin grafting in order to reform the, um, the integument in that area. Perhaps more important though than the degree of the burn is really the body surface area that's affected. Okay, so the percent body surface area affected. You see over here, both of these um, are showing you kind of how to calculate body surface area. The easiest way to do this in an adult is by using what we call the rule of nines. Okay, so the head represents 9% of the body area. Each arm is 9%, right? You see 4.5 on the front, 4.5 on the back. So 9% for this arm, 9% for this arm. Um, the legs are 18% total, 9% in the front, 9% in the back. Um, and then the, the abdomen and the back are 18% each as well. So 18% in the front, right, 18% in the back. It's kind of an easy way to calculate. Um, this is in an adult. It changes a bit in a baby. Um, when you look at a baby or a young child, the head is a lot bigger and the legs represent less. So the head is more a um, higher percentage of body surface area and the legs are a lower percentage of body surface area um, in infants and young children. Okay, so that takes us to the skeletal system. Um, remember, the skeletal system includes bones and cartilages of the skeleton. When we look at the skeletal system, we can break it up anatomically. 
into the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is every, oops, sorry, is everything on the vertical axis, right? So all the bones, if you drew a vertical axis through the body, all of these bones. So the bones of the skull, um, the facial bones, the bones of the neck and the trunk. So all the way down the spine, all of the vertebrae, the sacrum. Um, you can add the coccyx to this list, right? The coccyx or tailbone is included. Um, and then the bones of the thoracic cavity, right? So the sternum and 12 pairs of ribs are all part of the axial skeleton. The appendicular skeleton are the appendages, right? So the upper appendages, the arms, the lower appendages are the legs, um, as well as how we connect them to the body. So the arms are connected to the body at the pectoral girdle, right? Forms the shoulder joint. Um, so that would be the clavicle as well as the scapula. The legs, the lower extremities are connected at the pelvic girdle, right? So the pelvic girdle forms the pelvis. Right, so your hips, um, the ilium, ischium, and pubis that form the pelvis here. Cartilage is present in, in, in a few different areas in the skeletal system. Um, cartilage is present in areas that require flexibility, right? So think about the costal cartilages, right? We've got all these costal cartilages here that attach to the ribs. We have cartilage in the pubic symphysis, right? Remember there's this, um, pretty thick piece of cartilage here between the pubis bone and the latch and the right. We also have cartilage present um, at the articular surfaces of bones that are in synovial joints. So remember, like if I had two bones coming together here, say my femur and my tibia at my knee, that the ends of the bones are covered in articular cartilage, right? A nice cartilage cap. And that provides a little bit of cushioning between the bones, and it also provides this nice smooth surface for articulation, right, when the bones move. Now this is in an adult. Um, there's a lot more cartilage in infants and even children than there are in adults. And remember, that's because that when a skeleton is forming, it starts as mostly cartilage, right? There's this cartilage substructure and that's slowly converted into bone. It's slowly ossified. So when an infant is born, their bones are not completely bone, right? There's a lot of cartilage instead of osseous tissue. Um, so an infant's gonna have a lot more cartilage present than an adult is going to have. Looking over here at these pictures, you should easily, super, super easily be able to identify all of these bones, okay? Um, and specifically, not like the skull, but frontal bone, parietal, um, temporal, occipital, right? If not, review it, okay, right now, immediately. When we look at the skeletal system, um, all of these bones that we just looked at are either compact bone or spongy bone, right? Or some combination of the two. When we talk about whether a bone is compact or spongy, we're talking about how the actual bone tissue is arranged. Compact bone is compact, right? So all of this area out here, you see pure bone tissue, right? You don't see a bunch of open spaces. So that's compact bone. There's a really, really dense arrangement of the bone matrix without open spaces. This makes bones strong, right? The more compact the tissue is, the stronger it is. Um, and this prevents or resists compression. And so the walls of our femur, the walls of the tibia are made of this compact bone and that's what allows them to hold up our weight without bowing or bending. Um, all of our bones have at least a thin outer layer of compact bone. Some, right, the ones that have to hold most of our weight, have a thicker layer of compact bone. Spongy bone is spongy. It looks like a sponge. If you've ever seen a real sponge, how it has like all these little holes in it, spongy bone has a lot of open areas in it. Um, it's an open arrangement of bone matrix. So you'll see like a rod of bone and then a rod of bone and a rod of bone. We call these trabeculae and then you'll see all these open spaces in between, right? Just like what you see in here. Um, we see spongy bone in the center of bones, really everywhere except for where there's an open medullary cavity um, that's been carved out for marrow. We see that we've got red bone marrow present in spongy bone. So in all of these open spaces between the bone tissue, we'll see red bone marrow. And of course, that's where we make the blood cells red blood cells and white blood cells, and where we make platelets as well. 
So when we look at the skeletal system, um, there's a lot more to know than just the names of the bones, right? The anatomy of a skeletal system is pretty complex because all of the bones have specific bone markings that you guys should be familiar with. Um, these are just some examples that you see here. Um, again, you guys should go back to your anatomy lab books and kind of flip through and make sure you're familiar with the majority of these bone markings. We will go through them, um, or a lot of them, again, throughout this semester. These just give you some examples. Right? A canal, for example, is a, an open passageway. Um, we've got a lot of them in the skull because it's a, a pretty um, secure surface a bone and we need to pass things through, right? We gotta pass blood vessels through, um, nerves pass through. So we've got a lot of passageways through the skull. Um, canal, some of them are called um, canals. Foramen, right, or foramen, we have a lot of foramen present in the skull. So right here above the eye, supraorbital foramen, right? You remember under the eye, infraorbital foramen. In the chin, we had mental foramen, right? A lot of passageways, canals, foramen through the skull. Processes are just areas that are sticking out. So like right here, for example, um, this process right here is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. You'll see processes throughout um, the skeletal system. Um, let's see, over here, you see the head of the humerus. A head is just a big rounded projection, right? Um, so there's the head of the humerus right here. Down here, you see that the femur also has a head. The neck, remember, is like the thinned out part by the head, which makes sense, right? Head, neck. Well, we'll see that on a lot um, of the bones that we see. Um, over down here on the femur again, there's a trochanter, right? This large rough per, um projection right here. This is the greater trochanter. And then remember down over here, there's a lesser trochanter. Condyles are rounded processes, right? So here's a condyle right here. In the bottom, there's another condyle, right? The medial condyle and lateral condyle of the femur. Um, you see condyles on the humerus as well. Um, the troclea, right, is this portion of the humerus, remember, that articulates with the ulna. Okay, um, the crest right here, the iliac crest. I'll let you guys go through this. Um, again, this is not a complete list. It's just kind of some examples of some of the different bone markings. If you want to go through more complete, um, go review your AMP1 lab manual. Otherwise, we'll go through and kind of review stuff throughout the whole semester. There are multiple different types of bones. Um, long bones are long. Right, their, their length is much greater than their width. Um, they're, regular, they're relatively tubular, right? So long bones include the femur, um, the fibula, the long bones um, of the hands, right? And the fingers, so the metacarpal bones, all of the phalanges and the fingers, um, the humerus, the radius and ulna, these are all long bones. Short bones are like cubes, right? They're relatively short and cube-like. Um, we find short bones in the wrist, so all uh, the eight in each wrist carpal bones, and then also in the ankles, so the tarsal bones in each ankle are all short bones. Flat bones are flat, right? They're kind of like these little sandwiches um, with the two compact bone layers on each side, um, and they normally serve protective functions. So um, the flat bones of the skull, right, of the cranium, um, those protect the brain underneath. Irregular bones are bones that are just have kind of really crazy weird shapes with lots of processes and they don't really fit into any other cavity um, or any other um, type of bone. So when we look at the face, a lot of the facial bones, like the zygomatic bone, the nasal bone, um, the sphenoid bone, right, the big butterfly of the sphenoid bone, these are all irregular bones and they don't fit into any of the other categories. Finally, the sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bones are small little bones that develop in conjunction with tendons. The most common sesamoid bone that most people are going to have is the patella, right? So the patella develops in conjunction um, with the quadriceps tendon, right? And it acts as a pulley. It's a nice smooth surface that the tendon slides over as the muscle pulls on it. 
People have um, irregular numbers and locations of sesamoid bones. Frequently, you'll see sesamoid bones um, on x-rays in the hand, um, but you're, they're, they're all pretty irregular, um, the number that you'll have in the places that they'll be, except for the patella is um, found in almost everyone. So let's talk a little bit about some clinical implications of the skeletal system. Um, the first one here are accessory bones. Accessory bones are extra bones um, that are not a normal part of the skeleton. However, they are found in a lot of people. A relatively large percentage of people have at least one accessory bone. Um, the foot is the most common place to have an accessory bone. Here you see um, a few accessory bones. The ostrigonum is an accessory bone on the talus bone. Um, this is the most common accessory bone that people have. You also see um, an accessory bone that's present just outside um, the cuboid. Sorry, right over here, just outside the cuboid, there's another accessory bone. Um, the foot's the most common place for them, and the, the biggest problem with accessory bones is pain. So if somebody has pain that's intractable as a result of the bone, then we can remove it surgically. Otherwise, it's no problem. Osteoporosis is a reduction in bone mass, um, and this ends up making bones brittle and more prone to fracture. The major risk factors for osteoporosis are age and sex. Right? The older you get, um, the more bone density people tend to lose. And then sex, the female sex, um, puts you more at risk for osteoporosis. And the reason for that is hormonal. Um, the sex hormones stimulate the production of bone tissue. And remember that after menopause, women have a severe drop in hormone levels. So the bones aren't stimulated as much, and um, you start to lose bone mass. Men can have a decrease in hormone levels, but it's not as severe and abrupt as um, the decreases in females. So females happen to have um, more osteoporosis. Osteoarthritis is a degenerative joint disease. Um, it occurs because of irreversible degeneration of the articular cartilage. Remember I told you guys that um, bones that are enclosed in synovial capsules have articular cartilage, a layer of nice cartilage covering the bone. So the bones can articulate nicely together, right? They can move really nice and smooth at the joints. Well, with age, this articular cartilage slowly starts to degrade um, and degenerate and break down. So older patients um, are at a higher risk for osteoarthritis, um, the degeneration of this cartilage that results in pain. It's most common in joints that support weight. So think of like the knee joint, right? The hips. Um, and then also joints that are highly active. So like your hands, right? The joints of the finger and the wrist are really, really highly active. Okay. The muscular system includes the skeletal muscles. But remember, we actually have multiple types of muscle, right? There's skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Skeletal muscles, cardiac muscles, and smooth muscles are all different on an actual cellular level, um, and then their function is different as well. Skeletal muscles are striated muscles, meaning they appear striped. Remember, because of the way that the protein fibers are organized, when you look at the muscle through a microscope, you see actual striations or stripes in the tissue or in the cells. Um, skeletal muscles are really large, um, long fibers. And because of the way that they develop via the diffusion of tons of myocytes, the resultant fiber ends up being multinucleate, right? There's many nuclei present in just one cell. The skeletal muscles are typically connected to the bones, but they can also be connected to ligaments, to the fascia, um, or to organs. Skeletal muscles are under voluntary control, right? So we um, consciously send a signal to tell our muscles to contract. And this is why we can control our body movements or our facial expressions. When skeletal muscles contract, they move the bones, right? Again, this is why we can move. Um, and then of course, other structures as well. Again, facial expressions um, occur because of the skeletal muscles, not moving the bones, um, but moving the tissues of the face. Skeletal muscles also support the body. 
um, right? The abdominal muscles are important in um, maintaining posture and position. And then they also generate warmth as well, right? Heat in our body comes from movement of our skeletal muscles. Hence, when we're cold, what do we do? We shiver to warm up. Cardiac muscle is also striated, so it does have striations or stripes present in it. Um, but the cells are much smaller, right? They're small, um, kind of like branched cells. They look kind of branched like this. Um, and they're uninucleate, right? There's one central nucleus present in a cardiac muscle cell. Uh, cardiac muscle cells form the myocardium, right? The, the thick um, muscular tissue of the heart. Cardiac muscles, uh, it displays automaticity or autorhythmicity. It can contract um, because of specialized cells in the conducting system without any neuron involvement at all. However, we do have neurons that innervate the conducting system and alter cardiac contraction um, or alter heart rate, but those are under involuntary control. We don't consciously control our heart rate. Um, and of course, when the myocardium contracts, the function there is to propel blood through the body. Smooth muscle is not striated. It appears smooth, hence the name smooth muscle. Um, again, the cells are relatively small, spindle-shaped cells, and they're also uninucleate. Smooth muscle forms the tunica media, the middle layer of blood vessel walls, as well as the walls of many hollow organs like um, the stomach or the intestines. Smooth muscles under involuntary control. Uh, again, we don't consciously control smooth muscle or tell it when to contract. When smooth muscle contracts, this um, affects the diameter of blood vessels, right? So smooth muscle contraction dilates, uh, sorry, constricts the vessel and then re relaxing it dilates the vessel. Um, peristalsis in the GI tract, right? So the wave-like contraction that pushes stuff through the GI tract occurs because of smooth muscle. Um, smooth muscle causes pupil constriction and dilation and altering light. Um, and then it also causes peristalsis in some other organs. So for example, in your readers, um, the peristalsis that keeps the urine passing down into the bladder is because of smooth muscle. Here you guys can see the three different muscle types, um, just illustrating what I just spoke about. Again, cardiac muscle cells from the heart, the cells are branched so that they um, interconnect with neighboring cells. You can see a single nucleus in the center of the cell and you can see the striations or stripes. In skeletal muscle, you see um, each of these kind of columns is showing you one muscle cell or one muscle fiber, so they're big. Um, they're striated or striped, and you can see one cell has many nuclei. One, two, three, just from what we can see um, in this small portion of the cell. Smooth muscle, you can see there's, uh, again, relatively small spindle-shaped cells, right? They taper at the ends. There are no striations present, and you can see a central nucleus. There's kind of a lot on this slide regarding the anatomy or organization of um, muscle. One here at the very end, you can see um, all of the collagen from the, um, the kind of layers, the epimycium, paramycium, and endomycium. The collagen from those layers all merge to form a tendon or what we call an aponeurosis at the end of the muscle. And that helps to connect the muscle to the bone. Um, when the collagen forms a tight bundle, like you see up here at the top, we call that a tendon. Um, the collagen can also form a flat sheet, and in that case, it's an aponeurosis. Okay, so the palmar aponeurosis, you can see here, you see how like, there's this white flat sheet there. That's the collagen connection. It's just an aponeurosis. Um, same thing here. This is showing you um, the aponeurosis of the palm. Right, and then the really tight kind of bundles um, form tendons. Looking at the muscle, again, there's so much to see on here. Um, the epimycium, right, is the tissue that covers the whole outside of the muscle, right, the entire outside of the muscle. Coming off from the epimycium, the paramycium comes in and it surrounds muscle fascicles, right, or bundles of muscle fibers. So here you see a bundle of muscle fibers, right? A fascicle, and it's surrounded by the paramycium. Coming off of the paramycium is the endomycium, right? Which goes in and surrounds individual muscle fibers. So each muscle fiber is surrounded by the endomycium. 
here you see one individual, sorry, I can't draw with the mouse. Here you see one individual muscle fiber, right? So it's surrounded by an endomycium. And when you look at it, it's made up of tons of myofibrils, right? These little threads or little strands that are just made up of repeating units of proteins. All of this should be super familiar. Um, here, this is just showing you um, different shapes or ways that we can classify skeletal muscles based on their shape. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of helpful in the naming of muscles, right? So orbicularis are circular muscles. So orbicularis or oris, again, circling the mouth, right? Remember, we have orbicularis oculi that circles the eye. Um, so you guys should be able to kind of come through these and look at these and recognize these shapes. Um, convergent. Notice that all the muscle fibers converge on this one point right here. So this is pectoralis major is a convergent muscle. Um, <clears throat> again, go through and just kind of look at these. If you have any questions, we can talk about them in class. The thing that's not listed here is um, digastric. Di meaning soup, right? Gastric like belly. Digastric muscles. Uh, the omohyoid in the neck is an example of a digastric muscle. Digastric muscles have two bellies that are um, connected by a tendon in between. So it's like a belly of muscle, tendon, and then a second belly of muscle. Okay, so this brings us to the cardiovascular system. Um, cardio meaning heart, right? Vascular pertaining to the vessels. So this includes the heart, the vessels, and then also the blood that flows through the vessels. Um, you guys see the heart, right, right here and right here. You should become um, comfortable with the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. Um, you guys should become comfortable with coronary circulation, so all the blood flow that's going to the actual myocardium um, with the valves, right? So if we have my right atrium here and my um, right ventricle right here. Remember the valve in between those, right? The right AV valve is the tricuspid valve. On the left side of the heart between the left atrium and the left ventricle, the bicuspid valve is called the mitral valve. We also have got two semilunar valves. Um, from the right ventricle going out through the pulmonary trunk, at the base of that is the pulmonic valve. And then remember the aorta, coming out from the left ventricle at the base of the aorta is the aortic valve. Okay, so all of that should be super, super familiar. Um, <clears throat> also again in the cardiovascular system are the vessels. When we talk about the vessels, we've got arteries, capillaries, and veins. Arteries by definition go away from the heart. We have arteries classified in the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. Remember the systemic circuit are the vessels that bring blood out to the body and back to the heart. The pulmonary circuit brings blood from the heart to the lungs and back. Um, so when we look at arteries in the systemic circuit, they're carrying oxygenated blood, right? Because they're taking that blood to go out and deliver it to the body. However, arteries in the pulmonary circuit are carrying deoxygenated blood. That's kind of weird, right? That's the only time we're gonna see arteries carrying deoxy blood um, is when they're the arteries in the pulmonary circuit. Um, when we look at arteries, we can classify arteries as elastic arteries. These are really big arteries um, like the aorta and its branches. Um, these arteries are typically under high pressure so when the blood gets put into them really um, really hard with a lot of pressure, they need to be able to stretch and then snap back to normal. Um, <clears throat> medium arteries, medium sized arteries are our muscular arteries. Okay, the, um, the femoral artery is an example of a muscular artery. And then our smallest arteries, um, and the smallest of our arteries are called arterioles. All of these arteries that you see over here should be familiar. You should have learned all of these already. Um, so just kind of look through them really quick, refresh your memory, and then um, we'll add details as we go through the semester. After arteries, remember the blood flows into capillaries. Um, capillaries are essentially just thin endothelial tubes. When we think of, um, most of our blood vessels have up to three layers, right? The tunica externa, the tunica media, the tunica intima. 
um, which is an endothelium, an endothelial layer. Capillaries are just the endothelial layer. They're just a thin um, endothelium with a basement membrane. So they have very, very thin walls. Um, remember, the reason for that is that capillaries are the location of all exchange between blood and interstitial fluid. So nothing enters or leaves the blood unless it's in a capillary. Um, when we look at capillaries, capillaries interconnect arteries and veins, right? So the arterioles and the venules, the smallest arteries and the smallest veins are interconnected by capillaries. Capillaries don't exist as single little tubes though. They're these interconnecting um, networks. So we say that capillaries are arranged in capillary beds. There are multiple different types of capillaries. Most capillaries in the body are what we call continuous capillaries. Um, there are specialized continuous capillaries in specific areas, including the brain and the thymus. Um, in these specialized capillaries, tight junctions exist between the cells, so there's very, very reduced permeability. So it's really hard to cross uh, these, these specialized capillaries. Remember, this is why we have the blood-brain barrier and the blood-thymus barrier. Fenestrated capillaries have fenestrations or pores present in the endothelium. So what this does in the plasma membrane. So what, um, <clears throat> sorry, the basement membrane. What this does is creates an increased permeability through the fenestrated capillaries. So for example, fenestrated capillaries are present in the intestines because we need um, pretty large nutrients and then ions and water to really rapidly cross through as they're absorbed from the intestines into the blood. So we have these extra pores or fenestrations present in fenestrated capillaries to allow that um, rapid exchange to occur. Sinusoids are even more permeable. So when we look at sinusoids, there are actually gaps between the endothelial cells and sinusoids. So they're very, very permeable. Um, sinusoids, for example, we see sinusoids um, in the bone marrow, right, where we've got blood cells that have to enter. We see sinusoids in the liver. In the liver, remember, we make um, plasma proteins. And in the liver, we have um, a lot of kind of cleaning large things out of the bloodstream. Um, there's a lot that's happening in the liver, so we need these really large gaps. After the capillaries, the blood collects into the smallest veins, which are called the venules and the venules merge to form larger veins and the veins get larger and larger and larger as they carry the blood back towards the heart. So the definition of a vein is that it is carrying blood back towards the heart. When we look at most veins throughout general circulation or systemic circulation, the veins are gonna be carrying deoxygenated blood. Hence that we normally have them colored blue um, on most models and pictures because um, there's no oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, so the blood has a darker appearance. All of the veins that you see here in this picture um, are systemic veins, so they're going to be carrying the deoxygenated blood. Veins in the pulmonary circuit, however, so um, the right and left superior and inferior pulmonary veins are carrying oxygenated blood because they're returning from the lungs back into the left atrium. When we look at veins, specifically the deep veins of the legs, we see that veins have, or some veins, have one-way valves present, right? And that's different than the capillaries, that's different than the arteries. And the reason we have these valves present is that um, there's a lot lower blood pressure pushing the blood forward in the veins. So when you look at veins, again, specifically down in the legs, they're pushing the blood back, fighting gravity, um, back towards the heart without a lot of force behind the blood. So the valves are present to help keep the blood moving forward and just help stop it from flowing back and cooling down in the lower legs. When we talk about veins, we can classify them again according to size. The smallest veins that are collecting blood from our capillaries are venules. Those merge to form larger veins that we call medium veins. Um, these are similar to what we would call muscular arteries. And then finally, the largest veins um, are called large veins. So these are things like the superior vena cava, um, the inferior vena cava, that are dumping blood right back into the heart. Um, let's talk about a couple of clinical implications related to um, the vessels themselves. 
Atherosclerosis is a really common form of arteriosclerosis. Um, and that's the, the sclerosis is referring to the hardening of the arteries that's occurring. Atherosclerosis is occurring because of a buildup of fat, mainly cholesterol, um, in the artery walls. So we see that plaques build up in the artery walls, and this interferes with the smooth flow of blood through the vessel walls. Um, the vessel walls are normally nice and smooth, and the blood flows smooth without a lot of turbulence. When we have plaques build up in the vessel walls, all of a sudden the blood can't flow smoothly, and there is a lot of turbulence involved. Because of the turbulence and the pooling of the blood, we see that uh, clots start to form. And the problem with the clot forming or thrombus formation um, is that that clot can get dislodged. And as long as it's flowing through a large vessel, there's typically not a problem. Um, but once it gets to the smaller vessels, say, um, in coronary circulation, so the vessels that beat the heart, or the small vessels in the brain, then we start to have really big problems. Remember, when a clot merges, or um, sorry, when a clot gets stuck in one of the coronary arteries, um, then we have myocardial infarction occur. When a clot or a thrombus gets stuck in one of the vessels leading to the tissue of the brain, then we have a thrombotic stroke occur. If we block blood flow to um, tissue in another part of the landmore body, then we can have tissue necrosis or tissue death occur, and we can have gangrene occur as a result. Okay, so atherosclerosis is, is problematic um, because it doesn't interfere with blood flow. It does increase uh, the blood pressure in the system overall, um, but even more importantly because of the clots that can break off um, and lead to other more severe conditions. Varicose veins refer to abnormally swollen veins, okay? and you can see them in the picture here. Like the veins um, get really full with blood, and you can see how large they are in the picture. So this occurs initially because the veins lose some of their elasticity, um, some of their strength, and they start to, to widen, and the blood starts to pool in them as they dilate. Now, as the veins dilate, the valves that are present in them become incompetent. Remember I said that especially like deep veins in the legs, valves are really important um, because it, it breaks up the column of blood that's leading back to the heart. Um, if we have a one-way valve, when the blood starts to go down, the valve closes, right? And the blood can't flow um, or can't pool down the legs any longer. Uh, and every time the muscles contract, the blood gets pushed up further and then the valve stops it from falling. Now, if the vein uh, dilates, right, if the vein gets larger, now when the valve tries to shut, it does not close all the way, right? The cusps of the valve don't meet each other. So now the valve is incompetent and we can't prevent the blood from dropping down. And we have this whole column of blood that's uninterrupted that creates a lot of pressure um, in the venous system. And it ends up creating backflow or, or a backlog of blood. And then we have even more pooling and even more dilation in the veins. And it's kind of this, this, this positive feedback, this worsening that occurs as the veins get more and more and more swollen. Again, varicose veins typically occur in the legs. Um, they tend to be common in professions where people are standing still for long periods of time. So pharmacists, um, for example, we always wear the, the Ted hose or the, the compression stockings because when you're standing in one place for such a long period of time, you've got the gravity pulling the blood down um, and you don't have that muscular compression to push the blood forward. That's why they always recommend you walk, get up and walk around for a bit so that the muscle can push all of that blood through the venous system um, and you don't have that pooling that occurs. All right, so we'll spend a little bit of time just reviewing the here you can see just more um, specifically some of the lymph nodes and the way that they're scattered throughout the body. Again, we mentioned supraclavicular um, above the clavicle, cervical, the neck. Um, over here, we said posterior auricular, right behind the ear. Um, <clears throat> Preauricular was in front of the ear, parotid by the parotid glands, right? The salivary glands right here. Um, submental under the chin. Um, right here, oops, sorry, right here, submandibular underneath the mandible, supraclavicular 
Um, again, we mentioned as above the clavicle. Over here again, you see we mentioned axillary, we mentioned supratrochlear. Remember the trochlea um, is a um, process that's on the distal portion of the humerus, right, in the elbow. Inguinal and the inguinal region, femoral with the femur, we mentioned popliteal. Remember the popliteal region is the back of the knee. And again, the purpose of these lymph nodes is really to filter the lymph, um, to remove pathogens, debris, toxins that might be present, and to alert the immune system to the presence of, a, of an infection. Just a little touch of the clinical impact of the lymphatic system. Lymphadenitis is an inflammation of the lymph nodes. And I'm sure you guys have all had your lymph nodes palpated before, right? When you go to the doctor when you're sick, what do they do? They palpate, right? They feel your lymph nodes to see if your lymph nodes are swollen. Um, and the reason for that is that when there is an infection present, um, the lymph nodes swell, right? Um, when, when there's an infection, the um, a lot of immune system cells start dividing um, and replicating and making antibodies. And, and that all causes an increase in the amount of fluid that's present in the lymph node. So you can palpate a lymph node when it's swollen, when there's lymphadenitis present. This also happens when there's cancer metastasis to the lymphatic system. Um, and the lymphatic system is a very common site of cancer metastasis. We'll talk about this in a couple, um, in a couple bullet points. Um, lymphangitis is the same thing, it's just inflammation of lymph vessels instead of lymph nodes. So cancer of the lymph nodes. Again, the lymph nodes are a really common site of cancer metastasis. And the reason for this is because the lymphatic capillaries are very permeable. If you think back um, to AMP and you remember that the lymphatic capillaries form as little pockets in the periphery. And remember that the cells that line um, the lymph node overlap with each other like this, and they form little valves. So when there's enough pressure in the interstitial fluid, the valve opens, right? The cells do this and the fluid, um, cellular components, whatever, can enter into the lymph. And then it can close if there's back pressure so that the lymph doesn't flow backwards into the interstitial fluid. Um, because of this, the lymphatic vessels are very permeable. They're supposed to be permeable because remember, if there's an antigen present, we want it um, to be able to go into the lymph so that we can alert the immune system and the lymph nodes. Um, but cancerous cells can also break off and enter into the lymph very easily. So if there's a tumor present, the cancerous cell can break off. Um, it goes or enters into the lymphatic system, flows through the lymph, and then eventually it gets lodged in the first lymph node that it gets to. It gets lodged in the lymph, no lymph node and the cells start replicating. Um, and then all of a sudden we have a site of metastasis, right? We have a secondary cancer site present in the lymph node. Typically when there's um, cancer metastases to a lymph node, what we do is we remove that node. Um, we'll remove the affected lymph node and typically the upstream lymph nodes as well, because it's possible that um, cancerous cells have broken off from that node and that they've gone forward to the next lymph nodes. Um, <clears throat> The result of this is that the patient is then susceptible to another um, disease of the lymphoid system, and that's lymphedema. Um, lymphedema occurs when lymph drainage is blocked from one of the limbs. Remember that the whole point of the lymphatic system, or one of the points of the lymphatic system, is to collect excess interstitial fluid, right? And it flows through the lymph, and then we dump it back into the bloodstream. If that drainage of interstitial fluid is blocked, then all of a sudden there's this buildup or accumulation of fluid in the limb. Um, so example, if we remove um, cancerous axillary nodes, right? So if we remove the um, lymph nodes in the axillary region, then we're blocking the drainage, sorry about that, we're blocking the drainage of fluid from the limb um, and the fluid accumulates in that limb. So lymphedema can occur in the affected limb. All right, 
So we're going to start talking about the nervous system and the whole rest of this lecture will be an overview of the nervous system, the organization of the nervous system, um, neurons versus neuroglia, the different fibers, um, spinal cord, a lot of nervous system information. And the reason for that is that this anatomy course has absorbed the clinical um, neuroanatomy that you guys used to take. So we'll do a lot of nervous system information right now, and then also the last couple weeks of the semester will be on neuro. So the nervous system can be um, broken up anatomically into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is just everything in the central region of the body, right? So the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system, or PNS, is then everything outside of the central nervous system. So that includes the nerve fibers that carry messages to and from the CNS. That, in care, that includes um, ganglia, or masses of cell bodies. Um, that includes nerve endings and receptors. Um, everything that's out in the periphery of the body, body is the PNS. Now, the PNS, or peripheral nervous system, can be broken up into afferent divisions and afferent divisions. Afferent divisions um, are part of the sensory nervous system, and the afferent fibers carry signals to the CNS. So we sense something, and we send that signal to the central nervous system so that we can become aware of it or we can register it. So that is the sensory division or the afferent division. The motor division or efferent division includes the parts of the peripheral nervous system that carry commands out to the body. Okay, so we can carry commands out to skeletal muscle to contract. We can carry commands out to smooth muscle to contract to our glands. Um, if we're taking a signal from the central nervous system out to the body, that's the motor division or the efferent division. So if we look at the sensory division of the peripheral nervous system, we can break that up into somatic sensory or somatosensory and visceral sensory. The somatic sensory um, portion includes the general senses like touch, pain, temperature, pressure, vibration, texture, um, as well as proprioception. So proprioception, remember, is like sensing your, your place, sensing your position, rather. Um, sensing where your limbs are, right? The position, position that your joints are in, the position that your um, muscles and skin are in. That's proprioception. Um, also the spe special senses of hearing and equilibrium, as well as vision. So all of that is included in um, the somatic sensory portion of the upper and the vision. Visceral sensory information um, refers to sensa sensations coming from the viscera, right? Or like, like related to the, um, the organs, the lining of the organs and membranes. So the types of visceral sensory information that we would get um, is information from stretch receptors, right? We can tell um, stretch of, say, the bladder or the stomach, um, stretching of the lungs, stretching of the vessels. Um, so stretch receptors, we can sense pain, temperature, um, chemical changes. Um, we can also sense irritation. Um, so for example, irritation that stimulates coughing and sneezing, those would be visceral sensations. Also, nausea and hunger, as well as the special senses, taste and smell. These are all included visceral. But regardless of what the sensory information is, um, it's still part of the sensory division of the PNS, and we still send that information to the central nervous system via what we call afferent fibers. Okay, so afferent fibers or afferent signals are going to the CNS. The opposite would be the efferent division, um, or efferent fibers carrying information out from the central nervous system. When we talk about the, um, the motor division or the, the efferent fibers, we can break that up into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic no nervous system just includes um, the fibers that are innervating skeletal muscles. Okay, so um, carrying our voluntary signals or reflexes out to our skeletal muscles. Okay, that's the somatic division. The autonomic nervous system is a little bit more complicated. Um, the autonomic nervous system includes the motor innervation of smooth muscle, 
cardiac muscle and glands. This is involuntary, right? We don't have conscious control of this. Um, this is autonomic, right? Or automatic self-regulation. Now, the autonomic nervous system can be broken up further into the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. Um, remember, the sympathetic division is what we always nickname fight or flight, right? So an increase in heart rate, um, increase in pressure, increase in respirations. It's catabolic, right? We break down um, all of our nutrients to fuel the body. And the parasympathetic is what we will call rest and digest, right? So lower respirations, lower the heart rate and pressure. Um, it's more anabolic, right? We're conserving energy and building up our resources with the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is our overall organization. And we'll spend a lot of time today kind of talking through all of the details of this nervous system. When we talk about the nervous system, the nervous system includes um, mostly nervous tissue. And if you think back to tissues, you guys will remember that nervous tissue includes two general types of cells, neurons and neuroglia. Neurons are the functional units of the central nervous system, or sorry, of the nervous system in general. So neurons, when we say that they're functional units, what I'm saying is that they complete the actual function, the actual communication of the nervous system. Neurons are specialized for rapid communication, right? They're very excitable and they have the ability to receive um, a lot of information and to possibly generate an action potential to propagate that information to a target cell. Neurons form synapses uh, with either other neurons or with their target cell. Remember a synapse, if we're looking at a synapse, essentially we're just looking at where the neuron, the end of the axon, the synaptic terminal, comes up very closely to a target cell, right? And this area where the neuron is communicating with its target cell is the synapse. Now, because the neuron is not touching the target cell, remember that the neuron has to release a neurotransmitter and that that neurotransmitter is gonna cross this synaptic cleft and bind to a receptor on the target cell. And that's how the neuron is going to communicate with its target cell. When we look at the structure of a neuron, um, the main region here is the cell body, right, where there's the nucleus um, and majority of the organelles. And then there are a lot of processes coming off of neurons, and we can classify these processes as either dendrites or an axon. Typically, there are many dendrites present, and the dendrites are these shorter, highly branched processes that come off of the cell body. When we look at dendrites, dendrites are where the neuron is going to receive messages. Right, so there are messages coming into this neuron from all of these dendrites. And the way that a neuron is receiving messages is via what we call a graded potential. And remember that graded potentials are different from action potentials because a graded potential can be either excitatory or it can be inhibitory. So these messages that are coming into the neuron, depending on the ion channel that they open, they can stimulate this neuron or they can inhibit it. They can make it harder for this neuron to send a message down its axon. So the dendrites are where the neuron is receiving messages. They're short, highly branched um, connections with many microscopic dendritic spines sticking out everywhere. The axon is a single long process that carries information out to the target cell. Okay, so the axon is where the neuron is sending messages. And the neuron sends messages via an action potential, okay, or a propagated spread, a propagated change in membrane potential that goes all the way from the axon hillock, right, this wide part where the axon attaches to the cell body, and that action potential is going to spread all the way down the axon. It should go down um, any axon branches that are present, and it should progress all the way to the synaptic terminal, right, or the, the terminal bouton, the little wide part at the very end of the axon. 
And that's where the neuron is actually going to communicate with its target cell. That's where it synapses with the target cell. Now, axons might be myelinated. Remember that myelination of the axon, this wrapping around the axon, um, has the ability to speed up the propagation of an action potential, or it allows neurons to communicate faster with their target cells. We'll talk a lot about that um, a little bit later in the lecture. So we said that the nervous system um, is made up mostly of nervous tissue, and we said that nervous tissue includes neurons and neuroglia, and that the neurons are the functional cells, right? The neurons are the highly excitable cells that communicate and send messages um, all around the body. Neuroglia are the support cells of the central nervous system. So neuroglia are not the highly excitable communicating cells. Neuroglia are actually non-excitable, but they're absolutely necessary for the function of the nervous system. The function of the neuroglia are to support um, and protect and nourish the neuron. So the neuroglia keep the neuron functioning appropriately. Um, glia actually means glue. So neuroglia is telling you like, neural glue, right? The glue that holds the nervous system together and keeps it functioning appropriately. When we look at the neuroglia, we see that four types of neuroglia are present in the central nervous system, and two types of neuroglia are present in the peripheral nervous system. And each of these cells has its own special function. So astrocytes. One of the major functions of astrocytes um, and thing that we're going to really look at the most in this class is that astrocytes are important for forming the blood brain barrier. Forgive me, I cannot write with this pen on here. Um, astrocytes form the blood brain barrier. Remember, astrocytes are these really large star shaped cells and they form a lot of the um, kind of substructure for the nervous system. And they have a lot of different functions. Um, astrocytes also are responsible for sclerosis or forming scar tissue um, in the central nervous system. But for our purposes now, we'll look at their ability to form the blood-brain barrier, right? They induce tight junctions between the endothelial cells so that um, the capillaries in the central nervous system have very, very distinct um, or very, very reduced permeability. It's very difficult for things to leave the bloodstream and get into the central nervous system. Um, oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are important because they myelinate. They myelinate axons in the central nervous system. So um, remember, myelination speeds up an action potential, allows neurons to communicate faster. If the axon is in the central nervous system, it's going to be myelinated by an oligodendrocyte. Um, ependymal cells are important. Ependymal cells form a membrane called the ependyma, and that membrane lines the open spaces of the CNS. So it lines the ventricles of the brain, um, and then it also lines the central canal that goes down the spinal cord. And this is important for the production of cerebrospinal fluid, right, or CSF. So the ependymal cells um, help to filter the blood out of the choroid plexus, right, the mass of capillaries um, in the ventricles. So the ependymal cells help to filter um, fluid out of the choroid plexus and um, into the open spaces, and we call that fluid CSF, right, cerebrospinal fluid. That CSF, remember, um, flushes through the ventricles through the cerebral aqueduct, the fourth ventricle, um, and then it goes down through the central canal of the spinal cord. And ultimately it um, flows through the inner surfaces and it bathes the outer surfaces of the central nervous system. The CSF ultimately, um, again, it flows through the subarachnoid space, right? So all around the outside of the spinal cord and the brain, and then ultimately the fluid gets drained into the venous sinuses of the brain. So ependymal cells are important in forming um, that CSF and keeping that CSF flowing. Finally, microglia. Microglia are um, little phagocytes. 
So microglia have these little tiny processes and they go and they probe all of the spaces and crevices in the brain and they phagocytize or engulf things that shouldn't be there. So we'll just say that they clean up the central nervous system. Now the peripheral nervous system includes Schwann cells and satellite cells. Schwann cells also myelinate axons. But Schwann cells myelinate axons in the peripheral nervous system. Um, they actually surround all axons in the peripheral nervous system. So a Schwann cell can engulf a whole um, group of axons and just kind of sheath them and protect them. Um, or it can wrap around and around and around and around one axon in order to myelinate it. But if an axon is in the peripheral nervous system, it's going to be enveloped in some way by a Schwann cell. Satellite cells are also in the peripheral nervous system, but satellite cells surround cell bodies of neurons in the periphery. So um, cell bodies are grouped into ganglia, remember? Right, the groups of cell bodies in the periphery are called ganglia. And those, um, those ganglia, so autonomic ganglia or sensory ganglia, they're surrounded by satellite cells. Um, and if you think about it, that, that makes sense that we would surround those cells and protect them. The neurons in the central nervous system are highly protected, right? We said we've got the blood-brain barrier. We, we keep them in an isolated environment. So it makes sense that we would want to surround and protect the neurons in the peripheral nervous system as well. Right? So we do that with the satellite cells. They surround and control the environment around the neurons in the periphery. So let's look a little bit at the anatomy of the central nervous system. When we look at the central nervous system, um, which includes, again, remember the brain and the spinal cord, we can break this tissue up into gray matter, and white matter, literally because it appears gray or it appears white. So when we look at gray matter, we see that gray matter appears gray because this is where we have the neuron cell bodies. And if you remember, um, the neuron cell bodies are full of what we call nasal bodies. These are really dense little areas of um, ribosomes and Rafi R, and they actually appear gray. So because we've got a bunch of mesal bodies in the cell body, the cell body appears gray. So anywhere where we have a bunch of neuron cell bodies, the tissue appears gray. Um, <clears throat> so where do we have gray matter, right? Where do we have all of these neuron cell bodies? Um, we have them in the central nervous system, right? We've got them grouped in little areas or groups that we call nuclei, right? So we've got um, nucleus grouped in certain specific areas of the central nervous system. We'll, at the end of the semester, we'll look through and we'll see um, the olivary nucleus, the red nucleus. There's a lot of nuclei scattered throughout the brain. Also, we see gray matter throughout the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex. Um, remember that these are the superficial regions of both the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So if you look up here, this is showing us um, a, a frontal section, right, or a frontal view of the brain. So if we slice through, we can see all of this tissue out here. Right, this is all cerebral cortex, and you can see that it is dark colored, right? That's gray matter. Um, down here, right, this is an actual brain that's been sectioned, and looking in at it, right, you can see like these are the lateral ventricles, the open spaces, see the longitudinal fissure, right? and on the outside, all of this is darker colored, that is gray matter, right? That's the cerebral cortex. Um, I don't have the cerebellum picture here, but remember the cerebellum, when you um, section the cerebellum, remember you see all around the outside, all of this is dark, all of that's gray matter. And then remember in the, out, in the inside, you see this white tree shape, right? The arbor vitae, 
So the cerebellar cortex on the outside is dark. It is gray matter. Um, on the spinal cord, we also see that the spinal cord is sectioned into gray matter and white matter, but it's flip-flopped. Um, when we look at the spinal cord, the gray matter is actually uh, deep. It is not the superficial region. It is the deep region. So um, right here, we see the spinal cord, and you can see this kind of H-shaped region inside the spinal cord. That's the gray matter. And this is organized into horns. Right, the anterior horns, lateral horns, and posterior horns. Um, down here at the bottom, this is showing us an actual spinal cord. Right, it's been sectioned. Um, and again, you can see the anterior, posterior, and then the lateral horns. And this is all gray matter in the center. That's where the neuron cell bodies are. So white matter is where we have the axons. Right, so where we've got a lot of axons just carrying action potentials or carrying signals either in or out um, of the nervous, the central nervous system. When we see the axons all grouped together in the central nervous system, we call that a tract. Okay. Um, looking in the brain, we have multiple kind of tracts of white matter present in the cerebrum. Like, for example, this is one of the largest or most kind of obvious tracts. This is the corpus callosum, this white matter um, that connects the left and right cerebral hemispheres, uh, corpus callosum. Looking inside the cerebellum, we said that we've got the arbor vitae. Arbor vitae means tree of life because it looks just like a tree, right? Arbor means tree. Again, the cerebellum, remember I said here in the center, not that you can see this now, but here in the center, remember there's that white tree shape when you section the cerebellum. That's white matter, right? Those are tracts that are carrying action potentials in and out. When we look at the spinal cord, um, again, we said that on the spinal cord, instead of being on the, the deeper inside regions, the white matter is on the outer region of the spinal cord, right? So through all of these columns, the anterior columns um, or funiculi, the lateral columns and the posterior columns, that's all white matter. Um, or a tract that are carrying signals up and down the spinal cord. The brain and spinal cord, remember, are surrounded and protected by um, membranes that we call the meninges. And the meninges have three layers. Remember that the layers from the inside out, so from the deepest layer to the most superficial layer, the layers um, that surround the central nervous system include the pia matter, the arachnoid matter, and the dura matter. Um, the pia matter is very delicate. This is a very thin membrane that's directly on the surface of the brain and the spinal cord. So you can't even actually see it. Like looking on here, the pia matter is a super delicate layer that's completely covering the surface of the brain. Um, it's the only layer in the brain that actually um, goes down into all of the sulci, right? It goes down into all of the little grooves. It follows all the contours of the brain. Super, super delicate. Um, same thing here. When we look at the spinal cord, the pia matter is, is completely on the surface of the spinal cord and we can't really identify it well. The arachnoid matter um, is the middle layer. And the arachnoid matter you can kind of see here. Um, the arachnoid matter has all these arachnoid trabeculae or kind of like spider web like connections that connect the dura matter into the pia matter. And there's a decent amount of space between the arachnoid matter and um, the pia matter, right? So the space between the pia and arachnoid is called the subarachnoid space, right? So the space below the arachnoid matter, subarachnoid space. Um, this space is important because this is where we said the cerebrospinal fluid circulates through, right? What kind of um, neuroglia are important in producing CSF? Remember, appendimal cells, right? Pendimal cells are important in producing cerebrospinal fluid. And cerebrospinal fluid ends up flowing through the open areas, right? We said the ventricles, the aqueduct, through the central canal, and then it flows around and bathes the outer surfaces. 
um, of the brain and spinal cord. It does that by flowing through the subarachnoid space, so the space between the arachnoid matter and via matter. The dura matter is really tough. Um, the dura matter is the outermost layer. This literally means tough mother. Um, but the dura matter, you can see over here on the spinal cord, this has been cut, but this really tough outer layer is showing you the dura matter. Um, on the brain over here, it's this white part that's been cut. This really tough, strong layer um, is the dura matter. The dura matter um, really helps to, to seat belt the brain, if you will, or hold the brain in the center of the cranium so that the brain doesn't bounce around and get cranial damage, right? Get damaged because of the hard bones of the cranium. Remember that the dura matter actually folds down into the fissures of the brain and then it keeps going. So um, we call those dural folds, right? Um, for example, here in the longitudinal fissure, we see that the dura matter comes in across the brain and it dips down into the longitudinal fissure before continuing up around. That is a dural fold. That fold helps to hold the brain central in the canal so that it doesn't bounce around. Um, that's the tentorium cerebri. Remember, we also have a dural fold that goes between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And we have another one that goes um, in between the cerebellar hemispheres. Again, they help to hold the brain in place. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the meninges in the brain and in the spinal cord, we do see um, some differences there. When we look at the meninges in the brain, the dura matter is fused directly to the bones of the cranium, right? So the dura matter is actually attached to the cranium. There's no space between the dura matter and the bones of the cranium. However, when we look at um, the meninges in the spinal cord, we see that there is actually a space between the dura matter and the bones of the vertebrae, right, that surround the spinal cord. We call that space epidural space. So looking over here at this picture, you see the spinal cord in the middle, right, all around the very outside here, we'll see that there's dura matter and then you see the bone out here. Notice all this space. That is epidural space, right? It's filled with adipose tissue, which remember is just fat. Um, but this space, this it provides cushioning, if you will, between the spinal cord and the, um, and the bone. Um, but this space is not present in the brain. Right? So if we give an epidural, right, we deliver drugs into the epidural space, we do that in the spinal cord. Right? That is not possible in the brain because there is no epidural space in the brain. Um, also in this picture, you can see the subarachnoid space. So all of this space right here, this is the subarachnoid space. And what did we say flows through the subarachnoid space? That's cerebrospinal fluid. So if you do a spinal tap, Right, and you want to um, withdraw some cerebrospinal fluid. You need to insert um, the catheter into the um, subarachnoid space because that's where the cerebrospinal fluid is flowing through. So let's talk about um, a little bit of the clinical um, impact related to the nervous system. So we said that axons are important, right? Because axons carry information from the neuron out to a target cell. So when neurons communicate with each other, it's via axons. An axon has to be able to carry a signal to the target cell in order for the neuron to send a message. When we see axons that get injured in the central nervous system, they typically do not have the ability to regenerate and recover. Um, and the reason for this is that the central nervous system pretty rapidly forms scar tissue around that area. So after the axon is injured, um, the proximal stump, right, the end of the axon that's closest to the, uh, the cell body, begins to recover. It begins to, to regenerate and try and re reform so that it connect, can reconnect to its target. However, astrocytes come, in a, come into that area. And remember I said that astrocytes form the blood-brain barrier, but they also had another function that I mentioned. 
And remember I said that was sclerosis. That's forming scar tissue around a damaged area. So when an axon is damaged in the central nervous system, the astrocytes um, come proliferate and accumulate in that damaged area and they form scar tissue around the damaged area. Because there's scar tissue that's formed in the area, it literally blocks off the broken area. Um, and it's impossible for that axon to regrow and regenerate because of the scar tissue that's surrounding it. Um, sclerosis, this name sclerosis, refers to the actual um, scar tissue that's formed in the brain. Um, that's where the term multiple sclerosis comes from. If you guys have heard of multiple, scler multiple sclerosis or MS, um, MS is an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the myelin sheath, right? That, that myelin insulation or covering around axons. Um, that in itself destroys the ability of the neurons to communicate effectively, right? When the myelination is destroyed. But another thing that happens in the process is that when that myelination is destroyed, scar tissue starts to form in the area and um, the formation of scar tissue is sclerosis. Hence, we call um, MS multiple sclerosis because of that scar tissue. The peripheral nervous system, remember, includes all of the nervous tissue outside of the CNS, right? So everything besides the brain and the spinal cord. The PNS includes specifically nerve fibers that carry electrical signals or action potentials and then the nerve cell bodies that are present in the ganglia. A ganglion, remember, is a mass of nerve cell bodies that we find out in the periphery. Whenever we have um, neuron cell bodies out in the periphery, we group them together, and remember, we surround them with satellite cells, one of our types of neuroglia, and this protects them and keeps them in a nice regulated environment. This mass of nerve cell bodies we refer to as a ganglia or as a ganglion. Ganglia is plural. We have motor ganglia and we have sensory ganglia. The sensory ganglia are carrying um, afferent signals that are specifically visceral sensory signals. Okay, so visceral is in from the viscera. Um, the motor ganglia that are carrying efferent signals out to the periphery are part of the autonomic nervous system. Um, the autonomic nervous system, remember going to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands. We'll talk more about these ganglia um, shortly. So the PNS includes ganglia as well as nerve fibers. When we look at nerve fibers, we can classify the largest nerve fibers as either cranial nerves or spinal nerves. Uh, there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The majority of these actually connect to the brain itself. Um, cranial nerve 11, though, which is called the spinal accessory nerve, this actually arises mostly from the superior portions of the spinal cord. All 12 pairs of cranial nerves, though, actually exit out into the periphery via foramina from the cranium, right, or passageways through the cranium or skull. Hence, we call them cranial nerves. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Um, and when we classify these spinal nerves, uh, the, the number of them matches the number of the vertebrae in each region um, until we get down to the coccyx. So there are eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, five lumbar spinal nerves, five sacral spinal nerves, and one coccygeal spinal nerve. Okay, so eight, 12, five, five, one and that equals our 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Um, all 31 pairs of spinal nerves arise from the spinal cord and they exit out into the periphery via the intervertebral foramina. So remember when we stack the vertebrae together, how there's a little uh, foramina or a little passage foramen, um, or a little passageway between the vertebrae. So that's where all of the spinal nerves are going to exit from the spine and then travel out into the periphery. Again, we'll look at this um, in a picture later. Nerve fibers um, 
remember, are, are primarily made up of the axon from the neuron. Right? So in the very center of the nerve fiber, we have axons. And then surrounding the axon is a membrane that we call the neurolemma. And the neurolemma is made up of the Schwann cell membrane. Remember that Schwann cells are neuroglia, so support cells that we find only in the peripheral nervous system, right, the PNS. Um, and these Schwann cells can form a neurolemma in a couple different ways. So they can wrap around axons in multiple different ways, which affects the function of the axon. And we'll look at that um, below in just one second. So nerve fibers have the axon in the center. That's where the actual communication is happening. Um, then the neurolemma, which is made out of the Schwann cell, cell membrane. Um, and then the endoneurium. The endoneurium is a delicate layer that's surrounding that neurolemma. In a little bit, we'll look at some of the thicker connective tissue layers that are on the outside of the nerve fibers. Now, um, I told you guys that Schwann cells can surround axons in a couple different ways. And this affects what type of nerve fiber we have. Nerve fibers can be myelinated and unmyelinated, right? And we've mentioned this before. If the Schwann cell wraps repeatedly around the axon, right? So a Schwann cell is going around one axon and it wraps again and again and again and again. It forms a thick layer called the myelin sheath, right? And the myelin sheath speeds up the propagation of an action potential. So if a nerve fiber is myelinated, right, if it's insulated, then it's going to send action potentials and communicate faster. Not all nerve fibers are myelinated, right? This is big and bulky. Some nerve fibers are unmyelinated. When the nerve fiber is unmyelinated, it's still surrounded by the Schwann cell. It's just that instead of a Schwann cell wrapping repeatedly around the axon, creating a nice thick um, insulation, the one Schwann cell, Schwann cell, <laughs> one Schwann cell will wrap around numerous neuro, um, neuron axons, right? So like you've got a bunch of axons and one Schwann cell um, engulfs all of them or kind of groups them all together. So they're engulfed by a Schwann cell, but the Schwann cell is not wrapping around the axon over and over and over again. So it doesn't have this nice myelin sheath. Um, unmyelinated axons still send action potentials rather quickly, um, but not as fast as we see with the myelinated axons. So <clears throat> when we look at peripheral nerves, peripheral nerves are, are rather strong and they need to be, right? We don't want them to, um, to be break or crushed or cut easily. So we surround them and we protect them with multiple layers. First, we just mentioned the endoneurium, right? Remember, we said we have an axon. The axon is um, covered with a neurolemma from the Schwann cell. And then outside of that, we have a rather delicate layer that we call the endoneurium. Okay. Outside of that endoneurium, we have a perineurium. This is a dense layer of connective tissue. So remember, dense connective tissue is called dense because it's so densely packed with collagen fibers. Now collagen fibers give strength. Okay, so the perineurium is um, packed with collagen fibers and this surrounds fascicles of um, nerve fibers, right? Or fascicles, bundles of nerve fibers. Then outside of that, we have the epineurium. Again, this is a connective tissue sheath and this surrounds bundles of fascicles. So this is the outermost layer of the nerve, right? This surrounds the entire nerve fiber. This is what you would see um, from the outside if you're looking at the nerve fiber. And when we see this epineurium, we see that blood vessels, um, lymphatic vessels travel along the epineurium, and it also has fat tissue to provide cushioning. These names should look kind of familiar. Um, think back to the way muscle was organized. And remember that um, there was the epimyceum around the whole muscle, right? And then the paramyceum surrounded muscle fascicles or groups of cells. And then the endomyceum surrounded the individual muscle fibers. Okay? Very, very similar, except for now um, we're surrounding axons. 
Okay, so endo means within. This is the innermost layer, right, surrounding the individual axon and neurolemma. Um, peri is around. So peri is going around the groups or fascicles of nerve fibers. And then epi is upon. So it's upon the outside of the entire uh, fiber itself. And you guys can see that over here. Right, so look, this is a group of individual axons. So here's an axon, here's an axon, here's an axon. These are all axons. Okay. Surrounding each individual axon is the endoneurium, right? So there's an endoneurium, a thin, delicate layer that surrounds each of these um, axons. And then the perineurium is surrounding these fascicles or these bundles or groups of axons. Right, so you see the perineurium there, you see over here, there's um, more connective tissue, right, more perineurium over here surrounding this bundle. And then on the very outside, you see the epineurium, epi upon, right, upon the outside, the whole thing. And this is this another strong connective tissue layer, right, that's surrounding um, all of these fascicles. So we're grouping the fascicles together. This entire thing is a nerve fiber, okay? And then this is in reality, right? This is showing you that it really does exist the way that we draw it. Um, you can see the epineurium here, right, around the outside, grouping it all together. Um, you can see how we have the perineurium surrounding the um, bundles or fascicles, and you can't really see the endoneurium because it's tiny, um, but inside here, there is an endoneurium surrounding um, the individual axons. So here we have a couple clinical um, situations that relate to nerve fibers out in the periphery. When nerve fibers are damaged out in the periphery, there are multiple different things that can cause um, damage to the nerve fiber. Here we have a couple examples. Um, first, we have a crushing nerve injury. And then on the bottom here, we'll look at when the nerve is actually cut, when it's completely severed instead of just um, crushed. When we look at a crushing nerve injury, what we see is that the distal axon is damaged but the cell body of the neuron is fine right and the proximal stump of the axon is okay so the initial portion of the axon is okay and the connective tissue that covers the axon is still intact right so imagine we had this cell body right here's my axon please again forgive this this pen i will fix it <laughs> eventually um, okay, so looking at this, you have the axon here, and remember it has this connective tissue covering, right? So there's all this connective tissue surrounding the outside of it. When this is crushed, um, we'll see that the axon, say, in this area is damaged, okay? So the axon inside is damaged, but all of this is, is still good. The cell body is good, the proximal stump is good, and then remember, there's all this connective tissue out here, and the connective tissue is still okay. It was smushed, so the axon was, was damaged, it was ruined, um, but the connective tissue is still here. And then of course, over here at the end, we have our target cell that it was going to communicate with. Um, we can typically, our nerves in the periphery can typically re uh, recover from a crushing nerve injury. And the reason for this is that because the cell body um, and the proximal region of the axon are intact, they can start to regenerate, right? They can regenerate and rebuild the axon. Because this connective tissue sheath on the outside is intact, the axon knows where to go. We have kind of a map or a roadway that's showing us where that axon needs to grow to re-reach its target cell. Okay, so again, the connective tissue sheath guides the growing axon to the target so that the regenerated um, axon is, it heads to the right place. 
right? It just grows inside the connective tissue sheath um, and eventually it's able to regenerate and it, it comes right to the synapse where it's supposed to go to communicate with its target cell. Okay, so surgery is typically not needed in this case and the nerve does repair itself. With a cut nerve injury, however, um, this doesn't happen. So when we look at a cut nerve injury, the distal axon is damaged, but also the connective tissue covering the axon is damaged, right? Um, in this case, with a cut injury, we've actually completely, um, we've completely separated. Oops, sorry, I didn't realize where my pen was. Um, with a cut nerve injury, we completely cut this, right? We completely separate it. So we've damaged the axon, but we've also damaged the connective tissue out here. So there's no way for the growing axon to continue straight through and know where to go, right? The axon can try and repair itself, but it gets to this cut area and it's, it's lost, right? At that point, it has no, no idea of where to go to continue growing. So without guidance or, or a map to show the axon where to go, surgery is typically required. Um, we realign the, mu uh, not muscle, sorry. We realign the, um, the nerve fascicles as best as we possibly can. And then we secure the area with um, sutures through the epineurium. Hey, remember the epineurium is the layer that goes around the outside of the entire nerve. Okay, so we can suture that area. There are um, bridges or um, they look almost like a little tunnel or, or a little casing that we can put around the outside of the nerve fiber. Um, but ultimately we, we secure the area and then the, the axon has a roadway, right? Then the axon has guidance so that as it grows, it grows in the right way and it ends up growing directly to the target cell. Okay, so we're going to look at the spinal nerves in a bit more detail. And we'll start by talking about the spinal nerves that are involved with the somatic nervous system. Um, remember that the somatic nervous system includes the somatosensory fibers um, as well as somatic motor fibers. So the somatic sensory fibers or general sensory fibers carry the somatosensory information, right? Somatosenses like touch, pain, temperature, texture, pressure, vibration, um, as well as information regarding proprioception, right? Or position. The somatic motor fibers, right? These are efferent fibers that are carrying signals out to the periphery, carry motor signals out to stimulate the skeletal muscles. Right, so stimulating the skeletal muscles causes voluntary movements or reflexive movements. So the somatic nervous system has afferent fibers carrying somatosensory information in and efferent fibers carrying motor, um, motor signals out to our skeletal muscles. The spinal nerves we'll see begin at the spinal cord as what we call nerve rootlets. Okay, so from the spinal cord, there are um, little tiny branches that we call nerve rootlets. And these rootlets merge to form one single nerve root. We have um, an anterior nerve root and we have a posterior nerve root. Okay, so there's going to be coming from the front or anterior side, we'll have rootlets that merge to form one root. And then from the posterior side, we'll have rootlets to form one root. When we look at the anterior nerve root, the anterior nerve root carries motor fibers. So these are efferent signals that are coming out of the spinal cord. These, um, these motor fibers are coming from nerve cell bodies that are in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. Okay, so the anterior horn of the spinal cord here has cell bodies of motor neurons. Those motor neurons are sending efferent fibers out via the anterior nerve root. And then those signals, of course, go out to um, effectors like skeletal muscles. Um, the way I remember that is AM, right? Anterior motor. 
a.m. like the morning, right? 9 a.m. Um, the posterior nerve root is carrying afferent or sensory information in. Okay, so the posterior nerve root is carrying sensory fibers, sensory nerve fibers that are carrying sensory information in. Um, and that sensory information is coming from the periphery, from sensory receptors, and ultimately it's going to synapse in the posterior horn of the spinal cord. Okay, so think posterior sensory, right? PS, like at the end of a letter when you write, hey, PS, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so um, the anterior nerve root is carrying motor information out, efferent signals. The afferent signals from the somatic nervous system, so afferent sensory information about what you're touching, temperature, pain, um, is coming in via the posterior nerve root and synapsing on the posterior horn of the spinal cord. So here you can see what we've talked about so far, right? You see these, these are the nerve rootlets and the rootlets form to for, um, come together to form the nerve root. Okay, so these will be the anterior rootlets coming together to form the anterior root. In the back, posterior rootlets coming together to form the posterior root. Um, what type of signals do we have coming in the anterior root? AM, right? So motor, um, and those are efferent signals, right? So motor signals are going to get sent out via the anterior root. Um, and because we're talking about the somatic nervous system, remember these are going out to skeletal muscles as effectors. Um, what type of signals do we have going through the posterior root? PS, right? So sensory. And this is somatic, so somatosensory information that's coming in via the posterior root um, will be information on touch, pain, um, posture, right, position. Okay, so we know that the rootlets come together to form the roots. The two nerve roots, right, the anterior nerve root and posterior nerve root, unite to form the spinal nerve. Okay, so again, we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. The roots come together to form the spinal nerve. The nerves then are going to exit um, the, the canal, right, the vertebral canal, out into the periphery. And they exit, we said, through the intervertebral foramen. Remember, you have two vertebrae, right? The vertebrae all stack on top of each other, and the little tiny foramen or the little passageways in between adjacent um, vertebrae are called intervertebral foramen. Okay, so the nerve's gonna exit out through that intervertebral foramen. And then the nerve immediately divides or branches again. It's gonna divide into two branches that we call rami. Okay, so a posterior ramus and an anterior ramus. And you can see that over here, right? So this is our spinal nerve. And again, it's gonna exit the vertebral canal and then we have a posterior ramus. It's gonna go to the back, um, not to too many structures. And then the anterior ramus, that supplies quite a bit of area. So the posterior ramus um, is gonna supply nerve fibers or connect to nerve fibers that are essentially just in the back right there. Okay, so the synovial joints of the vertebral column, um, the deep muscles of the back, and then the overlying skin. So again, the posterior ramus is just going to that area right in that, um, the dorsal region. The anterior ramus, on the other hand, um, connects to nerve fibers, um, to a huge remaining area of the body, right? So the remaining um, central and anterior portions of the trunk, as well as the limbs. Notice we haven't mentioned the head, right? Remember that's because the head um, is supplied by the cranial nerves, right? The cranial nerves that attach to the brain for the most part. Um, you can see in reality here in the picture, the same structures, right? Here you can see these little tiny rootlets Again, they come together to form a root. Um, the posterior root and anterior root come together to form um, the spinal nerve. 
And the spinal nerve eventually is going to come out and branch into the dorsal ramus and ventral ramus. Here we've got posterior and anterior, right? Obviously, the ventral is the same thing as the anterior. The posterior is the same thing as the dorsal. The spinal nerves of the somatic nervous system transmit sensory information to a specific region of the body, right? So each nerve sends information to a very specific or carries information from a very specific area. Um, again, the, the spinal nerves also carry motor commands to a very specific area of the body. We call these areas dermatomes and myotomes, um, respectively. So what a dermatome is, is a dermatome is the unilateral area of skin that's innervated by the somatic sensory fibers of one single spinal nerve. Okay, so the area of skin that the fibers of C4, right, spinal nerve C4, carry information from, that's a dermatome. Um, we utilize dermatome maps. We've created dermatome maps that show the areas of skin um, that are associated with each of the spinal nerves. And we can utilize these when we're doing sensory testing to detect if a specific spinal, spinal, uh, spinal nerve is functioning or a specific segment of the spinal cord is functioning, right? So like the pinprick test. You can do the pinprick test and see, okay, um, can the person feel this or not? If they cannot feel it, then the chances are that the spinal nerve that's associated with that dermatome is not functioning or the spinal cord in that area that's receiving that signal is not functioning. I'll show you guys a dermatome map uh, on the next slide. Myotomes are, are kind of similar in that a myotome refers to the unilateral muscle mass that receives commands from the somatic motor fibers of a single spinal nerve. Okay, so the uh, muscle mass that's getting information from you know, the spinal nerve T4. Um, <clears throat> the problem with, with myotomes is that most skeletal muscles include multiple spinal nerves. Um, so it's not divided up so well as the dermatomes. Also, if you're thinking about telling a patient to move a specific way to check uh, if that spinal nerve is functioning, remember that most movements actually involve multiple muscles. So it's harder to isolate um, a specific movement with a specific spinal nerve function. So the way that we use myotomes with clinical testing is that the myotomes are grouped by joint movement. Um, what I mean by this, for example, is that we know that the muscles that flex the shoulder are innervated by the C5 spinal nerve. So tell a patient to flex the shoulder. Um, if they're unable to do that, then it's a possibility that the C5 spinal nerve or that segment is, um, is not functioning appropriately. Um, the muscles that extend the knee are coming from the fibers um, that go to the L3 and L4 spinal nerves. Okay, so again, we just group these a little bit differently, but it's the same concept as dermatomes. This is a dermatome map. Um, now different, there are slight variances in dermatome maps. And the reason for this is probably because there is some variance and some overlap. Um, there are areas that carry sensory information to two spinal nerves. Okay, so the barriers here are not exact and perfect. There is some overlap. Um, you will have to memorize this um, in another class, but let's, let's look at it now. It's not gonna hurt you to see this multiple times and you're more likely to remember it that way. Um, looking at the arms, um, it's, it's pretty easy to kind of count down, right? C4, C5, C6, C7 is just like right here, right? And then C8, and then down to the thoracic spinal nerves, T1 and T2 up the back of the arm, right? So C4, C5, C6, right, including the thumb, C7, and then down the back, T8, T1, T2. Not bad. 
Um, and then over on the leg, you're looking lumbar and sacral, right? So starting on the front in like the pelvic area in the very, very top of the thigh or femoral region, um, right in that like inguinal uh, crease. You see L1 going down L2, L3, and then inside outside. So L4, L5, right? And then starting the bottom foot, S1, S2, S3, S4, right? So you can, you can follow um, the way that this goes, okay? Again, you'll have to memorize it in another class, but there's, there's really no harm in learning it twice. So again, we're talking about the spinal nerves, and we just looked at the somatic function of the spinal nerves, right? The somatic fibers that are carried by the spinal nerves. The spinal nerves also carry visceral fibers. They have some visceral functions. When we look at the visceral fibers of spinal nerves, we see that the visceral fibers are purely or almost entirely sympathetic fibers. So sympathetic fibers, like the sympathetic nervous system, are conveyed by all branches of all spinal nerves. Okay, so up and down the spinal cord, 31 pairs of spinal nerves, we can see sympathetic fibers being carried by those nerves. Um, remember, this is visceral, right? So when you think about visceral effectors, um, we're not talking about skeletal muscle. Right, so the targets of these sympathetic fibers that are coming from the spinal nerves include the smooth muscle of the blood vessels, right, to um, vasoconstriction and dilation of the blood vessels, um, our sweat glands, and then also erector, oops, sorry, also erector pili muscles, right? Remember that, that fight or flight response. When you're scared, um, the erector pili muscle contracts and goosebumps, right, and your hair stands up on it. So all of the spinal nerves are gonna be carrying um, sympathetic signals to these effectors. Parasympathetic fibers, however, have very little association with the spinal nerves. Okay, so parasympathetic motor fibers. Um, also, remember there are some visceral afferent fibers, right, or some, some visceral sensory fibers that carry signals regarding stretch and pain um, from the viscera. These also have very little association with the spinal nerves. So when we're talking about um, the spinal nerves and we're talking about the visceral um, functions, the only function that we're going to see with the spinal nerves, or the only fibers that we're going to see rather, are the sympathetic motor fibers, right? So efferent signals that are going out within the sympathetic nervous system. So remember, we're talking about the autonomic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system carries e or has efferent fibers that carry motor commands going out to effectors, including the smooth muscle, right, in vessels and in um, the walls of hollow organs, um, to cardiac muscle, and then also to glands. Looking at the autonomic nervous system, we just mentioned that there are two divisions, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, you guys are probably familiar with calling it fight or flight, right? Fight or flight because um, when you're scared and you've got to fight or flight um, or run, that's the nervous system that predominates, right? Increases heart rate and respirations. Um, we can also call the sympathetic nervous system thoraco lumbar thoraco because the thoracic lumbar um the thoracic portions of the spinal cord and lumbar because of the lumbar portions of the spinal cord we'll see that with the sympathetic nervous system the initial neuron that's involved originates in either the thoracic or lumbar region that's why we call it thoraco lumbar the parasympathetic nervous system um, on the other hand you guys probably are familiar with calling rest and digest Hey, this is a system that predominates after you eat a big meal and when you're relaxing. The parasympathetic nervous system can also be referred to anatomically as craniosacral. 
And again, this just has to do with the um, origination of the neurons that carry parasympathetic fibers. Um, they come out of the cranial region, right? Cranial nerves, um, or out of the sacral nerves. So the very, very bottom um, of the spinal cord. When we look at the autonomic nervous system, autonomic conduction, so sending autonomic signals out to the periphery involves a series of two neurons. Okay, so it's not just one axon that carries a signal from the CNS out to the target cell. There are two neurons involved in the autonomic nervous system. These neurons are going to synapse or communicate with each other in something referred to as an autonomic ganglion. Okay, so the autonomic ganglia, remember, are going to uh, contain cell bodies of autonomic neurons. So because we have two neurons communicating with each other, we are going to classify these neurons as presynaptic neurons, right? The first neuron before the synapse and the postsynaptic neuron or the second neuron that exists after the synapse. The presynaptic neuron, the first neuron in the autonomic nervous system, the cell body is gonna be located in the gray matter of the central nervous system. Then the axon is gonna leave the central nervous system and travel out towards the autonomic ganglion. The postsynaptic neuron's cell body then is in the ganglion. It's out in the peripheral nervous system. Okay. So as we go through the autonomic nervous system, we're going to start by talking about the sympathetic nervous system in particular. When we look at the sympathetic nervous system, the presynaptic neuron, so the first neuron, the cell body is located in the lateral horn of the spinal cord, right? So remember the gray matter in the center. We've got anterior horns, lateral horns, and posterior horns. The presynaptic neuron, um, again, the cell body is in the lateral horn of the spinal cord. It's specifically in an area called the intermediolateral cell column, or your IML. So over here, you can see what we mean. This is the intermediolateral cell column. Okay, again, it's in the gray matter um, that's in the lateral horn of the spinal cord. And this exists only between the first thoracic, so T1, and then the second or third lumbar segment, so L2 or L3. So thoracolumbar. Okay, the presynaptic neuron, the initial neuron in the sympathetic nervous system, exists in the lateral horn of the spinal cord between T1 and the L2 or 3 segments. So that's the presynaptic neuron. Okay, again, sympathetic nervous system. The presynaptic neuron is going to start in the lateral horn of the spinal cord and then it's going to leave the central nervous system and synapse on the postsynaptic neuron. Now remember the postsynaptic neuron, the cell body is going to be in the PNS and some sort of an autonomic ganglia, okay, or a, a mass of cell bodies. So the postsynaptic neurons can occur in one of two places. For the sympathetic nervous system, the postsynaptic neuron can be in what we call paravertebral ganglia, a ganglia on either side of the vertebral column, or they can be in what's called prevertebral ganglia, pre as in before, okay, so ganglia that are located um, anteriorly to the um, vertebral column. So first let's look at the paravertebral ganglia. Um, the paravertebral ganglia are a series of ganglia that are interconnected to each other on either side of the vertebral column. Okay, so these ganglia form right and left sympathetic trunks, right, or chains, again, on either side of the vertebral column. So if you look down here, this picture is showing that, right? You see um, ganglia connected to another ganglion, connected to another ganglion. And again, these go up and down the entire length of the spinal cord on either side. 
Okay, that's what we call sympathetic trunk, right, or a sympathetic chain. Um, and if you look here again, you can see that first neuron, right, is coming from the lateral horn of the spinal cord, and it's um, synapsing on the postsynaptic neuron, and the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron is starting in the ganglia or ganglion of the sympathetic trunk or sympathetic chain. And then, of course, that um, fiber is going to leave and it's going to synapse on the effector organ. Now, the postsynaptic neuron can exist here in the sympathetic chain, right, the paravertebral ganglia, or we said that it can also be in the prevertebral ganglia. These prevertebral ganglia are located in the plexus, the nerve plexus, that surrounds the main branches of the abdominal aorta. Okay, so think back to the abdominal aorta, right? The aorta comes down and it's going to split into your common iliac arteries. And the abdominal aorta has multiple branches, right? Remember the celiac trunk, um, <clears throat> we're going to have the superior mesenteric artery and down, down lower the inferior mesenteric artery. Um, you're going to have your um, renal arteries going to the kidneys. These are all large branches off of the abdominal aorta. And we have um, ganglia that correspond with these. So there's um, this celiac ganglia around the celiac trunk superior mesenteric ganglia and inferior mesenteric ganglia surrounding the um, corresponding arteries. Aorticorenal ganglia surrounding um, the, the area where the aorta and renal arteries meet. So these are the prevertebral ganglia. Again, any of these ganglia, the reason they matter is that this is where the postsympathetic, or sorry, the postsynaptic neuron originates again in the sympathetic nervous system because we said the parasympathetic nervous system is not very associated with the spinal cord so here we can see all of that um, again at the top you can see in red we are just talking about the sympathetic nervous system and we're talking about the presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic neurons that carry sympathetic messages out to the body. Um, <clears throat> remember we said that the presynaptic neuron is going to originate in the lateral horn of the spinal cord and that presynaptic neuron is going to synapse on a postsynaptic neuron that's located in one of the autonomic ganglia um, out of the PNS. The autonomic ganglia can be classified as paravertebral ganglia. These are the ones that go down in the sympathetic chains on either side of the spinal cord. The prevertebral ganglia are located in these plexus that exist um, just on the anterior side of the abdominal aorta. Again, celiac ganglia, superior mesenteric, aortical renal, inferior mesenteric. Okay, again, they are prevertebral because they are um, anterior to the vertebrae. Paravertebral are on either side of the vertebral column. Okay, but in either case, they're autonomic ganglia um, that have the cell bodies of the postsynaptic neuron um, of the sympathetic nervous system. So, the presynaptic neuron, we said the cell body is located in the lateral horn of the spinal cord. The axon of that presynaptic neuron is going to leave the spinal cord via the anterior root. Uh, remember that these are autonomic um, fibers, but they are motor fibers, right? They're, they're um, efferent fibers that are going out to effectors. Um, and because these are motor fibers, remember that motor fibers leave via the anterior root. Remember we said A, M. And which kind of fibers go out via the posterior root? Sensory, right? P, S, or go in via the posterior root. Okay, so um, here you can see this in the picture. 
right? The presynaptic neuron cell body is in the IML of the lateral horn, right? And this is going to leave the, uh, the anterior root. And you see the anterior root merging with the posterior root to form the spinal nerve. So um, it's going to exit via the spinal nerve. And then right after the spinal nerve of branches into the anterior ramus and posterior ramus, this pathway, this sympathetic um, neuron is going to enter the anterior rami of spinal nerves T1 to L2, L3. Remember, we're, the only reason we're in this, this area here is because that's where the IML is, right? Intermediolateral cell column. The IML goes from T1 to L2, L3. Um, so, of course, that's where the cell bodies are. That's where um, the signal is going to enter the anterior rami. After the signal goes into the anterior ramus, it's going to pass into that sympathetic trunk that we just saw, the, the chain um, that goes up on either side of the spinal cord. It enters into the sympathetic trunk via something called the white rami communicate. Or communicante. Um, so the signal goes through the white rami into the sympathetic trunk, and then once it enters a sympathetic trunk, there are multiple different things um, that it can do. So again, you see this here, right? We start in the lateral horn of the spinal cord. Um, this the fiber leaves via the anterior root, right? That merges into the spinal nerve, and then it's going to leave via the anterior ramus and from the anterior ramus it goes through the white ramus into the sympathetic trunk right or the sympathetic chain here once the sympathetic fibers um, have left the spinal cord and once they've entered the sympathetic trunk they can do um, any of four things, depending on where they're trying to go, where they're going to innervate. Um, the first three options that you see here, these are the things that occur um, if the sympathetic nervous system is ultimately trying to innervate um, the head, the neck, the body wall, the thoracic cavity, the limbs, um, really anything besides the viscera of the abdominal pelvic cavity okay if we're innervating anything else um, then one of these three options is going to occur okay so the fibers can enter into the sympathetic chain and then they can ascend right they can go up and then synapse on a postsynaptic neuron at a ganglia that's higher up in the chain they could synapse right where they leave the spinal cord Right, so the presynaptic neuron um, could enter into the synaptic chain, or sorry, the sympathetic chain, and it could synapse at the ganglion that's right there at that same level. Um, it can also go down, right, just like the fibers can enter into the chain and go up and synapse higher up, they could also enter into the chain and then go down and synapse lower in the body. Um, and the reason for this is that Remember, the, the presynaptic neuron is located in the IML, right? And what did we say? Where does the IML exist? What parts of the spinal cord? The lateral horn, right? But remember, it's only between T1 and L2 to 3. So if um, the neuron, say, is going to innervate the head, it's going to have to go up higher, right? It can't, T1 is not high enough for that. Um, so the, the, the postsynaptic neuron, the second neuron, uh, the cell body could actually be higher or lower from where the presynaptic neuron is at. Um, if the sympathetic innervation is going to the viscera of the abdominal pelvic cavity, then this last, last option is, is what's going to occur. To viscerate any of the organs, or sorry, to um, innervate any of the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity, the fibers are going to pass through 
the sympathetic trunk without synapsing onto a postsynaptic neuron. So they're not going to synapse on any of the um, paravertebral ganglia. They're just going to pass through the trunk, just use it as a passageway. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, the fibers will pass through the abdominal pelvic splanchnic nerves and they'll go to where the prevertebral ganglia are. Remember, the prevertebral ganglia um, are in the plexus that's uh, just anterior or on the ventral side of the abdominal aorta. So um, the, the fibers can synapse in these prevertebral ganglia and then the postsynaptic neuron um, will ultimately innervate something, um, some of the viscera in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay, so that can happen. That's what you see right over here in B. So again, the presynaptic neuron is starting in the lateral horn of the spinal cord in the IML. It exits via the anterior um, root because these are motor commands. Um, <clears throat> you see it's coming through the anterior ramus. It's entering into the sympathetic chain, but it's not synapsing on those paravertebral ganglia. Um, the fiber is simply exiting and it's traveling along um, one of the splanchnic nerves, okay, in this case the greater splanchnic nerve, and here it synapses in the prevertebral ganglia. So in this case it's the celiac ganglion. Now we see our postsynaptic neuron traveling into, in this case, the kidney, um, and it is synapsing on the kidney itself. Okay, so that's one way that this can happen. Um, there is another option though. So <clears throat> some of the sympathetic presynaptic fibers will actually travel through this pathway, the pathway just like we just mentioned, but they won't actually synapse in the presynaptic, I'm um, sorry, in the um, prevertebral ganglia. Okay, they won't synapse in the ganglion, they'll simply travel through it. And what happens is the fibers will end up innervating the suprarenal gland, right, or the adrenal gland, and they synapse directly in the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal medulla, right, the central core region of the um, adrenal gland or suprarenal gland, actually acts kind of like the postsynaptic neuron in this case. Um, and the neurotransmitters in this case are released and enter into the bloodstream. Um, Remember that the purpose of this, the purpose of this sympathetic innervation of the adrenal medulla is so that we can get more of a systemic effect. Um, instead of synapsing a few target cells, the neurotransmitters are released into the bloodstream, they travel throughout the body, there's a systemic effect, and it's a longer lasting effect as well. So the neurotransmitters are, are being utilized like hormones in this case. The postsynaptic fibers in the sympathetic nervous system um, are great in number. There are a lot of postsynaptic fibers. And what this does is this really results in a very widespread effect when the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated. From the paravertebral ganglia, right, the ganglia that go down the sympathetic chain on either side of the, the vertebral column, the fibers can pass through gray rami communicantes or communicants um, to the adjacent anterior rami of the spinal nerves. Um, so remember the anterior rami are the, are the branches, right, that are carrying fibers out to effectors. So um, these, these sympathetic nervous system fibers can actually spread from um, one level of the spinal cord up to the next level of the spinal cord. And this results in a really widespread effect. Um, ultimately, what can happen is that the signal can reach all 31 spinal nerves, all branches of all 31 spinal nerves. Um, this happens when we're sending sympathetic signals out to blood vessels to cause a blood vessel constriction. Um, it happens when we're sending sympathetic signals out to erector pili muscles to cause contraction and it happens when we're sending sympathetic signals out to sweat glands. So the signal um, 
will, will, will enter into the sympathetic chain, it'll synapse, and then the postsynaptic neurons can enter in up to the next level and exit through the anterior rami. Um, and it'll go up into the next level and exit through the anterior, pardon me, ramus. Um, so that we get a really widespread systemic effect when we're doing any of those, um, those three sympathetic functions that I just listed. We'll finish with a brief discussion of the parasympathetic nervous system, um, which remember doesn't have a very big presence um, <clears throat> in the spinal nerves. When we look at the parasympathetic nervous system, the majority of presynaptic neuron cell bodies are actually in the, um, the cranial region. So the majority of presynaptic cell bodies are in the cranial region, and then we also see some um, in the sacral region of the spinal cord. So in the gray matter of the brain stem, we'll see the majority of the or parasympathetic neuron cell bodies. Um, the fibers from these presynaptic cells are going to um, exit the brainstem or exit the central nervous system via cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. Let's excuse that. 3, 7, 9, and 10. Um, 3, 7, and 9 are going to carry parasympathetic fibers to the head. They're going to innervate the head. Um, cranial nerve 10 is really important in carrying parasympathetic fibers to the majority of the rest of the body. Um, cranial nerve 10, you guys will remember, is called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve provides parasympathetic outflow to all organs in the thoracic cavity and the um, abdominal viscera everywhere, um, so the GI tract everywhere from the esophagus down to the left colic flexure um, of the large intestine. So where the transverse colon uh, flexes down into the descending colon. So all the way through the transverse colon, all of that, um, the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity down to that point, um, those fibers are all carried by cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. We did say that there are some neuron cell bodies in the gray matter of segments S2 through S4 of the spinal cord. Um, remember, we said the parasympathetic nervous system is, is not related to the spinal cord very much. The spinal nerves aren't dealing with parasympathetic um, outflow, except for um, the spinal nerves S2 through S4. So the fibers from these neurons will exit the spinal cord again via the anterior roots, right? These are still motor signals and motor signals go out via the anterior root of the spinal cord. Again, we said A. M. Um, so the, um, the fibers will leave via the anterior root of spinal nerves S2 through S4, and then these nerves will supply the descending and sigmoid colon and the rectum only. So very, very limited um, effect there. So in the parasympathetic nervous system, the presynaptic neuron um, is either located in um, the brainstem or it's located in spinal segments S2 to S4. And we said that the fibers are going to exit via cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, or via the... Um, the anterior roots from um, spinal cord segments S2 to S4. Now, the postsynaptic neurons um, are located in a few kind of discrete places. So the postsynaptic neuron cell bodies that are located um, in the head region, right, are the ones that communicate with cranial nerves three, seven, and nine are all in the head. So there are four pairs of parasympathetic ganglia in the head. And again, they communicate with these three cranial nerves. 
So cranial nerve three is going to synapse on. So you hear your ganglion, hear your secretions in the eye. Um, cranial nerve seven synapses on two pairs of ganglia. So the, um, the teropalatine ganglion and submandibular ganglion. So nose, mouth. And the cranial nerve nine is going to synapse on otic ganglion. So ear, right? Um, so this is parasympathetic alpha in the head. The vagus nerve, um, remember cranial nerve 10, is going to innervate a lot. Um, all of the organs in the thoracic cavity and the majority in the abdominal cavity. Um, and what happens here with the postsynaptic neuron is that the postsynaptic neuron is actually located very close to the target cell. Okay, so cranial nerve 10 is going to synapse on cell bodies that are directly on the wall of the target organ. So the presynaptic fiber is very long. It's going to extend all the way from the brain stem down to the target organ. And it's only um, on that target organ that it synapses to the postsynaptic neuron. So that means that the postsynaptic fiber is very short. And the result of this is that, it, that parasympathetic um, stimulation is much more specific. Um, it has a much more narrow effect, whereas sympathetic stimulation has a much more widespread effect, um, for the most part, kind of generally speaking. Um, organs <clears throat> that cranial nerve 10 innervates include um, the heart, organs of the respiratory tract, um, so smooth muscle that's present in the bronchioles, um, the lungs themselves, the liver and gallbladder, um, the stomach, the pancreas, the kidney, um, the small intestine, and then also the proximal large intestine, right? So the ascending and transverse um, colon are included in cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve innervation. Here you can really see all of this. Um, so for the parasympathetic nervous system, again, the, the presynaptic cell bodies are going to be located up in the brainstem. And the presynaptic fibers are going to exit the central nervous system via cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. 3, 7, and 9 are going to very distinct autonomic ganglia that are present in the head, right? And here you see um, the result of that stimulation. Cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, remember, is going to innervate organs in the thoracic cavity and in the abdominal cavity. Um, and here you see a really long presynaptic neuron that synapses directly on um, or very close to the target cell. Um, down here we see um, spinal cord segments, S1 to S4, and here you see innervation of the um, ab lower abdominal pelvic region, right? So at the very end of the intestine, and then um, the, so the, the descending and sigmoid colon, as well as the rectum, and then um, pelvic organs as well. Again, here you can see that um, this is a bit more specific and that you're not getting results all over the whole body like you see with sympathetic stimulation. For example, remember sympathetic stimulation, um, say, causing constriction of blood vessels. Because of the way the signal or the fibers travel up the sympathetic chain, you end up getting outflow from all of the spinal nerves and you end up getting constriction over, over the body, right? A really large widespread effect. But here you can see um, Stimulating, for example, cranial nerve 10 is only going to go to these target organs. It's specific. Um, if we send stimulation out over cranial nerve 3, again, it is specific. It's not over the entire system. All right, that sums up this first lecture. Um, this may be too much information for you guys to fit into the two hours that you have set aside for the video lecture. And if that's the case, don't worry. It's perfectly fine. We will go ahead and finish this in class. Um, before we go ahead and get into the next lecture, which is on the vertebral column and spinal cord.
Thank you so much, guys. Please email me if you have any questions at all.